Bueno, tal vez mañana también eh, eh, existan más personas presentes, ¿no? Porque es feriado. Sí, no. Yo no me hago ningún problema. La pantalla completa y mi... Entrada, ¿no? Sí, sí, se ve completo. Ya. So, welcome everyone to the second day of the Compute Dynamics Week. Thank you very much everyone for coming. Let's, con let's continue with the second part of the mini course, the basics of iterations given by the Professor Alfredo Boidier from PUCP. So, go for it. Okay. <coughs> We have seen yesterday that with very little knowledge, and by very little I mean the basics of complex analysis, uh, common sense, and calculus, topology, a little bit of topology also, we can do a lot in complex dynamics. However, there were parts, as, the, as you will remember, that I, will have to, that I had to rush because actually the arguments will slow me down. And remember that we were in the most simple cases. So the question is what's going to happen whenever we try to make life a little bit more complicated. And the answer is that we can, we can actually do a lot. And what is most incredible is that the way you have seen a lot of pictures, I've seen here's one of, one of you have actually, uh, your icon is actually a very nice, I don't know, perhaps a Julia set or something like that. You have seen pictures that are indeed constructed using actually computer algorithms. And the incredible thing is that what I'm doing, going to talk to you about has more or less a little has a little bit more of a hundred years and actually to the best of my knowledge there were no not even prototypes of what we can call a computer nowadays so the question is why they did it well we still don't know but the funny thing is that during three consecutive years the prizes, the big prize of mathematics in France was given to Montel in one year. And the next two years, I don't remember in which order, to the ones that actually best use Montel theorem by that moment, which were actually Julia and Fatou, whose names are going to be recurrent of both three. So the idea, is we're going to introduce the concept of normal families. And remember, you have an, an, a, sort of a set of analytical families, of analytical functions, all defined in a, in a common open set. And the idea is to give them the correct name. And the correct name is for them to be a normal family and that means when from each succession, from each succession, you can extract a convergent refinement. Of course, in some contexts like functional analysis, those are called pre-compact, and actually there are a lot of theorems that involve how when families are normal in the real analysis sense. But however, we are going actually to try to make of the concept a geometrical concept. 
related mostly with complex analysis. Okay, so our families, right, are analytic, the participants of the family are actually analytical functions, all defined in open sets. And remember, when you have convergence in open sets, you wish that that convergence is to be in compact subsets. Okay? So whenever you have, of course, after taking a refinement, whenever you have a limit of analytical functions, you will have that automatically your limit, whenever it exists, of course, is automatically uh, analytic itself. Remember, oh, an important feature here is that the family is supposed to be pre-compact. So that means that the limit may or may not participate in the original family. For example, if you are considering families of injective functions, you know that injective function, injective functions may converge to either a, a, a injective function itself or can converge to a constant family, to a constant element. Well, a constant element does not necessarily, well, it's not, not necessarily, it's definitely not uh, uh, injective. And as we're going to do iteration, the good news is that if you have actually pre-composition or post-composition of the limit, you may have that the chances of convergence may even increase. Essentially, they have the same chances of convergence if you change coordinates, right? But changing coordinates is supposed to be an open function, not a constant function. So here, when I am telling you that the chances may even increase, it's not going to happen in our context. The chances of having a normal family and having pre-composed or post-composed our family is going to be essentially the same. So, the criteria for convergence of analytical function, of course, is first that the notion of normal family. And sometimes it's very useful to remember how are the basic elementary criteria for convergence of analytical functions, right? For example, you will have that locally you can apply Cochise integral formula, and in fact, Cochise integral formula is very useful in these cases, right? And for example, Cochise integral formula, right, taking in the limit, for example, tells us that if a series converges, then the series that you can form with its derivative will also does. And also, a very easy application of Cochise integral formula is that whenever you have that, that you have that the limit of injective functions will be either injective or constant. We're not going to use that, but however, those are examples of how, for example, you can apply Cochise integral formula in this context. Okay, so the big news is Montel theorem. If I'm not wrong, it goes actually from just barely after First World War. And Montel's theorem tells us that a family of analytical functions, all of course defined in the same open set, taking values in the Riemann sphere, if you uh, have that, you know that all of the images of those analytical functions that participate in the family omit three points, then you necessarily have that the family is normal. Of course, when people the first time eh, they see this theorem, they will say, well, I will chew it. I will understand it little by little. And the good news is that you understand it little by little, but you never completely understand it until you notice that here, omitting three points in the Riemann sphere is essentially the same as that the image is actually in an hyperbolic surface. 
So those that you haven't thought about that idea before, here is even the proof that you have that Mon why Montel's theorem applies. So those who are not used to Montel's theorem, you can play it, you can think it as the name of the game. So whenever we are omitting three points, we are lucky. And actually, you can take in phase that the limit is going, to, or you can always take after passing to a to an adequate subsequence, you can always assume that you have actually convergence. So this is our starting point, and this is the starting point that is going to make easy everything that we have. If you take this in faith, everything that we have seen yesterday is going to be not even not only easy, but it's going to be completely natural, and it's going to be straightforward. So let's reintroduce iteration. Oh, no, sorry, we still haven't introduced uh, iteration. It's going to be one of our, our easiest examples, especially when we're going to work with iteration of polynomial. Is an example is that suppose that you have a family which is uniformly bounded. Well, if you have a uniformly bounded and a set of analytical functions, that is a normal family. Look that this is a very deep improvement of arsalas coli theorem, because Arcelas theorem, Arcelas coli theorem tells us that whenever you have a uniformly bounded set of functions and they are equicontinuous, then the set is precompact. Here in complex analysis, the only thing that you need is that your family to be uniformly bounded in order to have very easily limit or a lot of possible limits in this particular case. And what is behind is that it's going to be for free and it's completely hidden. You don't need to see the details that why those families are going to be, those functions are going to be uniformly bound. Okay? Whenever you are working with a normal family, whenever the, the word normal family appears and you have a subsequent, a sequence, you know that passing to the to a suitable subsequence, you will have guaranteed convergence. And you will start talking without laws of generality. Let's assume that the sequence will converge. Right? That's the idea. However, what is a completely different business is the uniqueness. For example, and this is not a normal, oh yes, it might be a normal family. Suppose that there is a normal family of functions that takes, for the first function is identically zero, for the first function is identically one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Of course, it's very easy to achieve a limit there. However, there are two choices, right? And we're not going to discuss it because by definition, what is going to stick is the name, normality, the property of whenever we want to, and we don't necessarily are going to want to, whenever we want to pass to a subsequence, we can have convergence. But remember, is the possibility that what makes things possible here is the chance, the possibility that whenever you pass to a subsequence, you got convergence. Not that you are going to necessarily pass to a subsequence. Okay? So, as I was telling you before, this is a geometric concept. So if you change your domain by a change of coordinates and you have a family that is normal in one, in one, system, in one coordinate system, you have that in the new coordinate system, your family is still going to be normal. In the same way, if you change coordinates in the, your domain, right, in the, in the target space, you have that also normality is actually a geometrical concept. So it fits normal in, in one set of coordinates is going to be normal in the other set of coordinates. What might change 
Of course, if you change coordinates, either in the domain or in the range is the presentation of the limit, right? But be careful, we're doing everything here happens within the framework of complex analysis. So whenever you have that functions can be evaluated, right? And singularities are either removable, essential, or, or meromorphic, or poles. When you have is that if in one coordinate you have necessarily a value, that means that the presentation of your function is completely holomorphic. So actually, infinite is out of the party. And you can never invoke infinity while you keep those coordinates. And that's going to be important. And you will say that that's a cheap trick, but actually that's true, right? Once you fix your presentation, that presentation is going to be unique and must obey all the complex analytic, all uh, the analytic, all the holomorphic laws that you are working. Okay? So now let's return to iteration of rational functions. Remember, rational functions is the quotient of two polynomials. And essentially, if you're going to iterate a single degree one rational function, that comes within a very actually easy theory, right? That's a Mebius transformation, a Mebius transformation, you can blah, 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 blah. And if you want to make it a little bit more complicated, more than a single rational function, you start working with a group of rational functions. And that came within the scope of the study of Klein and groups and the limit set. And what Russell Lodge told us yesterday, it comes within the dictionary of Sullivan. So what we're really going to, or what we're really interested here is the study of rational functions of degree at least two. And whenever we're working with a degree at least two function, we are going to define the fatu, the fatu, the fatu set of a rational function is the set of points that admits a neighborhood where the family of iterated, so you are a point belongs to the Fatu set, if whenever, if a point, there is a neighborhood, so that whenever you have that compositions and you restrict all of them to the same youth, you, you got a normal family. Okay. The set of points that allows that neighborhood is F, F for Fatu, of the same function. Okay, almost by definition, this is an open set. Because if this family, when restricted to an open set, is normal, that means that for any point in that neighborhood, this is that a normal, uh, there's a, uh, an auxiliary neighborhood that you can take, and all of those points belong to the Fatu set. And that's only that, right? That's by definition, it's a two set. But if you use a very simple topological argument mixed with a diagonal argument, you see that the Fatou set is by definition, or more than by definition, by a diagonal argument, is going to be the biggest set where the set of iterates assemble a normal family. And the reason is why, because you cover your whole Fatou set, which is open, with a <clears throat> fine, not, not, with a countable, with a countable number of open neighborhoods where the sets of iterates are normal. And whenever you want to extract a convergent subsequence, you use or you refer to a simply a diagonal argument and you get actually convergence also in the whole for two sets, right? So sometimes we're going to use it, sometimes not. 
Essentially, complex analysis makes no sense, or actually arguments in complex analysis make no sense if your domain is not connected, right? So this being an open set in the Riemann sphere is necessarily uh, an open or accountable union, or it's a most accountable union of connected open sets. That's it. Most of the arguments apply in each of those components. And each of those components is going to be a two component. Okay. First properties, which are sort of trivial. As I told you, if you pre-compose or post-compose a normal family by a non-constant function, you still have normality. So therefore, well, your, poly, your rational function is a degree to function, so therefore it's definitely not constant, it's an open map. And therefore, if you pre-compose with the same iterate that allows everything or post-compose one iterate less, you still have a, you'll still have normality. And that in practice means that your set is fully invariant. It's invariant while you look at it, and it's invariant if you look back in the, into the past. There are several examples, right? And remember, we were talking a lot of things, or I was trying to justify you a lot of property of the basin of attraction in a polynomial case. But once we know that in the polynomial case of degree at least two, infinite is attractive, actually super attractive, what we will have is that in its basin, we will have that the set of iterates converge uniformly in compact sets to infinity. Therefore, they form a normal family. Right? Some, you, don't, you don't need to look for the property that makes it a normal family. Being a normal family means that whenever you want to take a subsequent, well, here you have an in compact sets, you don't even need to take a subsequence. You have the, your original, your original uh, sequence is going to converge necessarily directly to infinity. What else that we have in the polynomial case? In the polynomial case, the part that I have to rush was precisely the ones that talk about the interior components of the Fatu set. So, if your field in Julia set actually has an interior, that interior is an open set that actually is bound, its iterate is bounded, right? Because by definition, those points that belongs to the field in Julia set avoids a very big circle. But avoiding a very big circle in practice means that they are bounded. And if they are bounded, the easiest criteria, the ones that remind us of our Salas-Coli theorem, tells us that the family is normal. Therefore, each component of the field Julia set belongs to the Fatou set. Of course, inside here, in those interior components, what we will have that iteration by your polynomial, the idea is that sends one component into the other, right? They are uniformly bounded, and actually it sends Fatou components into Fatou components. Well, definitely there are points which do not belong to the Fatou set, right? Remember our simplest uh, non-trivial iterate, which was the squaring, the squaring map. So if you stand in the unit circle and you look to your left, you will see that points blow to infinity. While if you see to your right, you have that points are actually sucked to zero. Therefore, as you have two choices, definitely, and those are you, they actually is always, right? So there's no way you can get subsequence that will be an exception here. 
what you have that is that those points are definitely not going to be in the Fatu set. Still, we're going to argue that a little bit, or we're going to argue that better. But that makes us think that there, that essentially the Fatu, the Fatu set at the end cannot be the whole Riemann sphere. Well, if we have uh, an open set, which is not the full space, that means that its complement is not empty. And its complement is necessarily a closed set. So here we have the, the Julia set. One was Pierre Fatou. This guy is Gaston Julia, right? No, uh, Montel was the, the priest of Mathematica. I don't know, I think it was 1918. And the other two were 1999, 1920, actually. And Montel didn't need coordinates. They do need coordinates. But even if you need coordinates, the fact that it is a normal, form, a normal formula or not, it doesn't change. Right? So actually, it's a very smart application of that. So what is not in the Fatou set, by definition, is going to be in the Julia set. But remember yesterday, we introduced another thing or another set that was called the Julia set. And remember the boundary of the basin of attraction of infinity was oh, the Julia set. So now we have two Julia sets. We have the Julia set as the iteration, the one that is the boundary of the filling Julia set. And we have another Julia set, which is actually the complement of the first two set. And the idea is to prove that both definitions agree. And that's what we're going to prove. And this is a very easy example of, for example, how can we apply or how can we look into properties or very I won't say complex properties of the Julia set, but actually very uh, interesting properties that happens in the Julia set. And the first thing is precisely that the boundary, the boundary of the feeling Julia set is precisely the Julia set thought as the complement of the place of normality. So we're going to prove, I would say, forget that this is the name, right? That this was a shorthand. Take a point in the boundary of the filling Julia set, and we're going to prove that that point belongs to the Julia set. And remember, Belonging to the Julia set was defined as not belonging to another set. And that belonging to that set was defined by having a property. So let's prove that definitely a point that belongs to this boundary does not has the property, the defining property of a normal family. And for that, we will prove that no connected neighborhood of a point, the restriction of the iterates can be normal. You will say, why connected neighborhood? Well, if you have a neighborhood where the family is normal, that's an open set. And the good things about open sets in those Euclidean spaces is that actually you can restrict yourself to a connected component. So, in particular, if the family is going to be normal, it's going to be normal in that smaller neighborhood. Therefore, let's suppose, or let's take a point which belongs, this is the boundary also here, this is also the boundary, it's not the, the Pugula said this is the boundary. So let's suppose that we take a point that belongs actually to the boundary of the basin of attraction to infinity. And we are going to prove that for that point, there is no way that we can find a connected open neighborhood 
such that when we restrict the iterates there, we got a normal form. So by contradiction, suppose that we have a subsequence, right? Because remember, this is a sequence and having a being normal means that for any sequence, you can find a refinement. This is the refinement such that that converges. And remember, convergence is to be here defined as convergence to an analytical function. So same domain, of course, and suppose that now it's here. Now, our target space, our working ground is the complex, the extended complex plane, the Riemann sphere. Okay, so this function can even be, if it's a constant, this function can be, let's see, holomorphic, can be meromorphic. Uh, what else? Can be constant, can be co equally identically constant to infinity, being constant equal to infinity. Infinity is like a point like, like anybody else, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So we keep going and suppose that actually this goes or converges to this. And let's see. The point is in this boundary, right? So it's in this boundary. That's the common boundary of the basin of attraction of infinity and the set of points that goes to that does not go to infinity. Okay. What means that a point belongs to the closure? If a point belongs to the closure, it means that any neighborhood will intersect points inside and outside. Well, if this belongs to the boundary of this set, that means that this neighborhood, and this is a neighborhood of A, right? This is a neighborhood of the point we will have that this intersection is not empty. So let's try to think what's going to happen with the iterates in this set. Well, let's look point by point, right? Remember the family is normal. Once you know it is normal, you can analyze what's going to happen point by point. And if all of that set, and this is the intersection of two open sets, you're in the basin of attraction of infinity. So by definition, if you start iterating, you go to infinity. So therefore, in this set or uniform, in, well, you know, you don't need actually convergence anymore. You will have that the evaluation of the limit in all of this point is equals to infinity. But this is an open set, right? This, the limit is G. So if your analytical function is identically constant in an open set, it means that it is globally constant in that same set. Right? Well, that's wrong. And I will tell you why. This point, the reference point also belongs to this neighborhood, right? So let's see what's going to happen if I iterate this point by this function. If I iterate this point by this function, this point is in the boundary, right? So that means that it's actually in the other set. It means that it is not going to go, it's not going to blow to infinity. Therefore, it remains in this set. And remember, this is a bounded set. And if this point belongs to a compact set that does not contain infinity, and you are seeking for a subsequence of that, that subsequence is going to converge and is going to converge to a point within that your compact set. And that point is not infinity, right? So therefore the limit, the value of the limit you're telling me that it converges for all points, right? It converges as a function. In particular, it converges punctually for every point. 
it converges to a point. And this is impossible because we have just argued why convergence can only be for each and every point to infinity. And this is a contradiction. Therefore, the Julia set of a polynomial, right, was a little bit more elaborated, actually, argument is to be what we defined before as the Julia set. And this is going to pay because arguments of this kind also works not only for polynomials, but for rational functions. Okay? So the Julia set is the complement of an open set. So it's close. It's the complement of a totally invariant set. So therefore, it is also totally invariant, right? So we have sort of for free now properties that those arguments are going to be close and totally invariant. Now, something that makes, and here using normal families is sort of trivial, is that whenever you have a rational function, and you fix an argument, or you fix actually a number of iterations, suppose actually for a rational function, that means that we're going to apply all these values and see our answers one hour from now, that's f. And you can take any n, then. That means that instead of checking the evolution hour by an hour, we check it 10 hours from now, what we will have is that the Julia, the Fatou sets do not change. And that's sort of trivial because if you take a subsequence of this, a subsequence of this is a subsequence of this. So therefore, you will find a, a, convergent, a convergent refinement. Now, suppose that you know that when you take n times, let's see 10, when you take the 10th iterates, you know that you can always find subsequence, subsequences such that it converges. And the question here is what happens if you take random? You're talking about the third iterate, the 15th iterate, the 27th iterate, the 40th iterate, and so on. Well, that's an infinite sequence, right? Because you're looking for infinite sequences of convergence. And in that particular case, you see what number of iterate you're talking and you divide by 10. And if you divide by 10, there is a residue that repeats infinitely often. And that, if that repeats infinitely often, you will easily see that whenever you have that the residue mod n uh, is the same infinitely often, you will see that because f of n is an infinite family, you will have that you can easily check uh, or, or you can easily look for a, ref a convergence refinement. But once this is true, there are a lot of consequences. For example, the complement of this is this, the complement of this is this. So th if those two are equal, that means that those two are also equal. Okay, so that was our example and we'll have that a connected component of the Fatou component I told you before, it's called a Fatou component. And the idea of, of uh, the modern point of view is in part to try to describe what is the behavior on the two components. And what is important is that iteration sends the two components to, into the two components, right, with a well-defined degree. And the reason why is that those functions are proper. That sends points which are go close to the boundary to points to go close to the boundary. But we're not going to use, at least today, that proper. Okay, so, well, <clears throat> we have a new way to attack our problems and we have all friends, like for example, periodic points. And the idea of, poly of 
close or periodic points is actually that they close a loop or what is the same, whenever you have the correct estimate of the iterate, you got a relation of this. Right? We are not necessarily anymore in the, in the polynomial case. And as we did yesterday, the multiplier, if you change coordinates, you have, for example, n minus one points from zero to n minus one in, in a periodic orbit. You can manage so that you change by a Mobius transformation, for example. If you change coordinates so that none of those points is infinity, well, you can define its multiplier again by the derivative of the first return map. But by the change rule, the derivative of the first return map is actually the product of the derivative of each jump. Right? And you see, Again, that the, that the multiplier does not change if you change. If you see it from here, you see that the multiplier does not change if you change coordinates. Right? Remember, because if you change coordinates in a fixed point, now the multiplier does not change. So if you see it, this in this part, you see definitely that the multiplier does not change. But if you see it from here, you see that as those numbers repeat themselves, you see that the multiplier does not change if you start counting the product or if you start looking or thinking that as uh, the orbit not of the first, but of the second or something like that. Okay, so the multiplier is an invariant that does not depend on the coordinate systems nor in the starting point. Now, multi all multipliers can be achieved, and this is an example. This is a polynomial example. If you take uh, this model, right, where you have a fixed point at the origin for quadratic polynomials, you have that zero, p of zero equals zero. So the multiplier, the only thing that you need to do is take the derivative and evaluate it in, the, and evaluate it in that point. You take the derivative here is lambda to set, evaluated in series lambda. So given any complex numbers, you will have a polynomial which has a fixed point with that multiplier. And by the way, if you want to practice, the other fixed point is one minus lambda and the multiplier is you only have to evaluate and so on. Okay. <clears throat> This is review, <clears throat> and this is actually very helpful, that a point has period capital N if and only if it is a fixed point of the nth iterate. <clears throat> and that remark may even look stupid, but however, at the end, it's very nice and it's very important because of this property. So whenever we want to study if, if a given point belongs to the Julia, or a given periodic point belongs to the Julia set or the, Fatou, or the Fatou set, we iterate that point and we think of that periodic point as a fixed point. So therefore, in order to understand thoroughly if a point belongs to the Fatou set or if a point of a periodic points belongs to the Fatou set or to the Julia set, it's enough to understand if a fixed point belongs to the Fatou set or if the Julia set. And not only that property, there are several properties that actually came within this framework. Okay. Almost, not by definition, by this formula, what we have is that the multiplier as a fixed point, which was the derivative of this, or the multiplier as a periodic point that you can think of this is, they are the same. However, there is a small catch because suppose you have a fixed point and you haven't realized that that is a fixed point. So you ask somebody and you ask for properties of that, you say, oh, it's a period three point. 
And you think, well, I saw that that, that was not a period three point, but a period seven point. So the question is, what, the, what is the relations between your multiplier, my multiplier, and the fixed point multiplier? And the relation is very easy, right? If you think this point has period n, and you assign to it multiplier lambda n, or somebody else thinks that it has period m, and he assigns multiplier lambda n, the relations between those numbers are actually relations by here. And the proof is very simple, right? Because actually at the end, you only have to compare this with a fixed point and this with a fixed point. And even if those two are not obviously equal, what you will have is that when you apply this rule and you compare this to this, you will have very easily your answer. Right. This is an exercise. So again, and repeating ourselves, trying to recycle uh, properties or definitions that we gave yesterday. We have a periodic point. It has a multiplier. And again, we will say that its orbit is attractive when its multiplier is smaller than one. We already see why that's true. We're going to call it repelling. We only have like sort of half justify why repelling when, when the multiplier is in absolute value bigger than one, it deserves the name repelling, right? It's sort of actually, it does not pulls, but pushes a little bit. But if you push a little bit, it doesn't mean that you are repelling, right? Something may happen. And that's exactly what happened in general with what is called indifferent or neutral points, right? And you see that if you have not, you know that a point is a periodic point, but you still do not, that you are not completely sure about the exact period or the minimal period, the important thing is that the status that you give with this, or more than the status is a definition, if you define something with one multiplier as attractive, whenever you have or you assign any other multiplier is still attractive. Right? Because if two numbers are related by if these conditions, what do you have? You will have several properties, right? One is zero if and only if, and only if the other one is zero. One is smaller than one in absolute value if and only if the other is smaller than one. One is bigger than one if and only if the other one is in absolute value bigger than one. One has absolute value equal to one if and only if, furthermore, there is another property. One is a root of unity if and only if the other one is a root of unity. So actually, in truth, what we're going to do is we're going to even special cover that with one period is say parabolic with any other period it will still be parabolic and enjoy all properties of parabolic periodic points okay so periodic critical points are very special and you would say attractive or or super attractive Periodic points are also very special. However, it's very easy to see once you fix coordinates that it is one and the same concept. You will have <coughs> that a periodic orbit is super attractive. Well, it's periodic, right? You write all the steps taken for the periodic point you calculate the individual derivatives and you check that the answer is going to be zero if and only if one of the individual factors is equal to zero. But when you apply the derivative and you find that the answer is zero, that means that you are in a critical point. So a periodic point is going to be super attractive if and only if it picks in its way a critical point. Now, Basins, right? In the, we have 
talk about the basin of attraction of infinity. In the squaring case, we have talked about the, the basin of attraction of the origin. And the idea is precisely that. Whenever you have an attracted fixed point, it's going to contract neighborhoods around itself. So therefore, it is going to attract at least a small neighborhood. But attracting a small neighborhood, again, we can use the same trick. And we will call the basin of attraction will be the set of, or we can describe the basin of attraction of that point, uh, the set of points that hit that open set. Well, the set of points that hit an open set with a continuous function is an open set, right? So the basin of attraction is given by the open set of all points that will converge pointwise, if you wish, but by continuity, it will converge in a small neighborhood of itself of this. And, wow, it converges in a small neighborhood, right? Converging in a small neighborhood is sort of like converging in some na compact neighborhood. Therefore, we will have is the set of points where the convergence is normal. So what we have just in some sense proof is that the basin of attraction of a point is necessarily going to belong to the Fatou set. And in fact, the basin of attraction is totally invariant. If a point converts to some point, if uh, the iterates converge, converge to some point, well, it doesn't matter if you don't notice now that you are going to converge to that point. You will converge, you will notice tomorrow. So therefore, that your image will also belong or your past also belongs. And that is in practice what means to be totally invariant. And a nice auxiliary property, right? The boundary in belongs, the boundary is the Julia set. And in fact, any point in the Julia set belongs to the boundary of any basin of attraction. And the argument is exactly the same. Pick a point in the Julia set. Pick a small neighborhood. Well, does neighborhoods belonging to the boundary of this open set must intersect it. So you will have points that will converge to that point. But if you do not belong to the basin itself, because you're in the boundary, you will have that you cannot converge to that point. Therefore, the function cannot converge to the constant function, which is ridiculous in that particular case. Well, yesterday, you saw several Julia sets or several process of iteration. One of those was, for example, Pascal show us some Julia sets of Newton's map. And the Riemann sphere was divided in colors. No doubt what the colors mean. The colors means that actually in that place, you were actually attracted to a root if you started built. However, they were boundary points. And if you make a sum around any of those boundary points, what you will see is all possible colors, all possible colors in that spectrum. And that is exactly what it is. Because if you are in the Fatou set, you will be in the boundary of any basin. That means that close enough, there will be points that converge to that set. Sort of tautological. If you have different attractors, there are different bases, right? Different attracting points, right? And whenever you have that a Fatou component contains an attractive fixed point, well, if that Fatou component has a fixed point, that means that that component maps to itself, right? So that if a component maps to itself, it means that it is going to be forward invariant. Not necessarily they are forward invariant. Remember in the Basilica yesterday, we have several bubbles. 
And the idea is that one bubble goes to the other one, right? So actually several, the attraction, the basin of attraction of that super attractive point is going to be, at the end is going to be all the bubbles, but that's a different story from now. So now, suppose that we have an attractive or a super attractive period end. How can we define the basin of attraction? Well, the basin of attraction is going to be the points that get actually sucked by that orbit. If you want to be a little bit more precise, what you, the best way to do it is to take the correct iterate, right? Remember, if you take the correct iterate, all points in the periodic orbit will become fixed points. But all fixed points are going to be attractive. Right? Because once you make a full turn, a full turn will be the full period. The multiplier will be the multiplier of the orbit. So therefore, if it's attractive in one point, it will be attractive in all of them. If it's attractive in, if it's super attractive in one point, once you take the end iterate, it will be super attractive in all of them. Okay. So what you do is simply you sum or you take the disjoint union of all of all of all basin of attractions, right? And we have a corollary, right? We know that those sets belongs to the Fatou set of the case iterate. And if they belong to the Fatou set of the case iterate, oh, they belong to the Fatou set of the original map. So again, the basin of attraction is a total invariant set. Right? It's not necessarily connected. Usually it's not connected and belongs to the Fatou set. Its boundary, by the same reason as before, belongs or coincides with the full, the Julia set in full. Now, how about repelling points? I don't know if I have written actually the proof, but the proof, I believe can be worded. And repelling fig points belongs to the Julia set. And that's sort of easy. Because, well, take a point, take a repelling fixed point in the Julia set. Oh, there are repelling, this is word, that's what we're going to prove. Let's take a repelling fixed point. And let's fix an open connected neighbor. And we're going to do normality test. And the normality test is given by the iterates. So suppose you have that the sequence of iterates converges, converges to an analytical function. Oh, let's see. You are in a fixed point. So first, let's give you coordinates, decent, honest to God coordinates, a number, right? So now you are a fixed point in your fixed point number seven. Why number seven? Because I have given you coordinates and you get stuck to that coordinate. You say, but normality is a geometrical argument. It doesn't matter. It's a geometrical argument, but if you claim that you are normal, you should actually, when I give you coordinates, you should behave very good with that coordinate. Okay, you say that, what? So you number seven, you start iterating yourself, but you're a fixed point. And if you are a fixed point, you don't move. So that means that actually you are tired of iterating and you see yourself, 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 and you say, Oh, I know where I'm going to go to the limit. The limit is going to be myself. Okay. That's from one point. But believe it or not, knowing information from one point, when we're working with normal families can be a lot of information. Because when I know that say, let's call the limit, in subsequence, if you wish, g of seven equals to seven, 
something that I know about that function of that analytical function, that that is an holomorphic function. So if that is an holomorphic function, what will happen with that derivative at that point? The derivative at that point should also be a number. And how can I calculate the derivative of that point with the derivatives? Okay, so you repelling fixed point, number seven from now on. What is your derivative? Oh, derivative doesn't, doesn't matter if, if, if I calculate it in this coordinate system or in another coordinate system. So it's my multiplier. So what do you know about your multiplier? I am repelling. So my multiplier is in, 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 in norm is going to be bigger than one. When I iterate it by the chain rule, right? The second iterate, the derivative is going to be square. If I cube it, the multiplier is going to be cube. If I iterate n times, the multiplier is going to be lambda to the nth. Well, even if I go to subsequence, that number is going to converge to what? It's going to converge to infinity. Oh, that's not possible, right? Because the derivatives converge to the derivative. And I was just telling you that the derivative must be a number. And in this particular case, it's infinity. Therefore, the moral is that repelling fixed points always belong to the Julia set, as there is no normal, there is no set where we can set a normal function. Okay, but once we know that this is true for fixed points, it is automatically true for, for a orbit with the same property, right? And repelling orbits actually are at the end repelling fixed points of some interest and that belongs to the Julia set all together. Okay, so have you learned something? Well, let's see, right? But I bet uh, if you didn't know some tricks or some issues or some strange issues of Newton's methods, you're going to understand today a little bit more of Newton's method than you did before. Even remember that Newton's method was sort of easy when you took your exams of calculus, right? It was a mechanical application and you understand what's going on. You understand the mechanics of the iteration and you were always able to find a root. And you had in your background several properties of Newton's method, but now, we're going, I hope that you will understand it a little bit better. And you will understand pictures that were given yesterday precisely for what happened with Newton's method, understood that as a dynamical system in this theory, in the theory of iteration mass. Okay, so Newton's method claims to be this. Given a polynomial of degree bigger or equal to two, Newton's method associated to a polynomial, that polynomial is a dynamical system generated by the rational function. This is a rational function because this is a polynomial, this is a polynomial. And actually, you will say that the Newton method is a dynamical system given by this iterative process, right? But I hope that you have learned from yesterday to, to today that those processes are to be understood or to be work as, or just, just to put them inside this framework, as a iteration of a rational function. And the iteration of a rational function, this is the image, so this is n, and for Newton, and this. Okay, this is more or less, perhaps not with that, 
what you are taught in a calculus book. Perhaps not with this, that was what yesterday you saw in several of the talks. And you haven't asked why there is a very stupid remark here that let P be a polynomial of degree bigger than two. How about Newton's methods for a degree one polynomial? Have you ever tried to apply Newton's method to a degree one polynomial? Let's see. A degree one polynomial, right? A degree one polynomial. Let's see. We will have the derivative, right? The derivative is a constant. What happens if you divide this polynomial by a constant? Well, what constant? The degree one constant. So you got that in a degree one case, this is a monic degree one polynomial. So it cancels with set. So therefore, the, the, the Newton method is a constant. Well, now that you know a constant, the question is which constant? Of course, the solution. Right, so that's the reason that nobody studies Newton's method for degree one, because if you apply Newton's method for a degree one polynomial, you get a constant. Which constant? The solution that you were looking for. So, so I'm going to try to fit Newton's method within the framework. And whenever I want to study anything, several things which are important, or because this is a rational function, and being this a rational function, it's important to understand what's going on with several elements. And the most important, perhaps, is the behavior of infinity. And the behavior of infinity it's a rational function. You can replace infinity. And what we can see if we replace here infinity is that, first of all, because, because the degree is bigger than 2, we will have that this is a polynomial of degree d. This is a polynomial of degree d minus 1. And if you replace infinity, you get infinity here. And in the limit here, you will get something that I will say is a fraction of infinity. And therefore, the value is going to be infinity. OK? So let's make it a little bit precise. Whenever I plug in to Newton's method, infinity, I got infinity. So it is a fixed point. What is important is that being a fixed point, I will have to check at least, to be honest, and check if this is, well, if it is not a trouble, to check if it is an attractive or repelling point, if it's easy to see if it belongs to the Fatou set or the Julia set. And in fact, I am going to calculate its multiplier. And its multiplier is going to be d divided by d minus 1. A real number, a positive real number, divided by a positive real number, which is smaller. So therefore, this quotient is strictly bigger than 1. So if, we, if I have a quotient, if I have a multiplier, which is a real number, strictly bigger than one, I will have that this fixed point necessarily belongs to the Julia set. Okay? So, how can I calculate 
דבר, how can I calculate actually the image of infinity, or how can I check if it, not, if it is not 100% obvious that the image of infinity is infinity, how can I calculate? I can switch coordinates. I can bring infinity to zero. And the way I can bring infinity to zero is by actually a simple-minded inversion. A reciprocal more, more than inversion. So therefore, my new dynamical system is also the reciprocal of the previous evaluated in the reciprocal of the variable. Right? If I replace everything, where do I replace it? I replace it in uh, this one, in this formula, right? So I will have that, what do I have is, what I have is this, hmm, but it's not clear that I got this. What I was supposed to get, oh yes. I have subtraction, I have to, so this set actually equates the degrees. Right, so the degrees will be say k a sub k minus a sub k. So it will be k minus one a sub k, and here they are. Right, they will be a sub k minus minus k. In that's the way. So here I have this. The denominator I have that. Right, and actually this goes, this multiplies everything here, because remember that was the degree of, of the polynomial. And what else? The degree that disappears is precisely the A naught. And here I have the derivative, the derivative in the denominator. Okay, so I can factor omega. And I can see a deep quotient, and when I see a deep quotient, remember I can now evaluate at zero, and if I evaluate at zero, this is zero, this part is zero, this quotient is different from zero, and it will be multiplied by omega. And if I expand this, right, as a quotient of two polynomials multiplied by lambda, the leading coefficient will be this quotient, where I cancel and I have d divided by d minus one. So if it has the form, this form, I will have that the multiplier will be d divided by d minus one. Okay, the details can be easily checked around. Okay, so now we know that infinite can not give us any surprises. Right? Because infinite, whenever you iterate and you reach infinity, you will never leave infinity. And that's a repelling point. Therefore, if you are a number and you get too big, you're going to be pushed, try to be pushed away from infinity. Right? Because that's the idea of being repelled. So now let's look for the other fixed points. And if you look for the other fixed points, you know that infinity is a fixed point. So if you're looking for the other fixed points, this is an honest algebraic equation and you try to solve n of c equals to c. So if n of z equals to z, that means that those two cancel and the zeros are going to be precisely the zeros of p, right? Because you cannot get infinity in the baron except evaluating at infinity, but you know what's happening at infinity. So the only way that you get that those two are equal is if P of Z equals to zero. So the fixed points of Newton's method are precisely the zeros of my original polynomial plus the point at infinity that I had the, preca the precaution of, of make the cal my calculation first. 
So the idea is what happens with those points? Well, we know that actually from our high school days, that if you are very close to the fixed point and you apply Newton method, you converge to that point. So therefore, the fixed point should be at least attractive. But in order to calculate, in order to calculate uh, if they are attractive or not, we should uh, we need to calculate the derivative of Newton's method. And I'm not going to return, but a very easy calculation yields that the derivative of Newton method is the, first, the original polynomial multiplied by the second derivative and divided by the first derivative squared. And the reason is very simple, right? Because Newton's method in one is his presentation is quotient by the derivative. And the usual Leibniz, Leibniz rule, when you have the derivative with a quotient will involve the square of the denominator. So you don't have to check it. I have, everybody has calculated this and it's a 10 seconds calculation. So we were talking about fixed points, right? Because remember, our goal is to find the roots of the polynomial. And we know that the roots of the polynomial are the fixed points of Newton's method. So we are looking for the derivatives in the fixed points, in the zeros of P. Oh, look at that. This is the derivative. And if we are looking at a zero of P, this is a zero, right? And if this is a zero, we multiply whatever you want and you got that this value is going to be zero. Wow, but that's the derivative, so that's a multiplier. Therefore, you have a super attractive point. But there's a small catch. This might be zero but it may cancel with this still. So our first conclusion is, before looking at pitfalls, is think that life matters. And if whenever we evaluate it at one of the solutions of one of the roots, we want this to be zero, and we want no trouble. We want the denominator not to be zero. And we will have that simultaneously, we will have a root of a polynomial and a root of its derivative in case, just in case the root is multiple. Therefore, for simple rules, this number, this denominator is going to be non-zero. This, it doesn't matter. And this is going to be zero, and therefore now the multiplier is going to be zero. Therefore, we have our first proposition, which is actually the way that most of you have used Newton's method at least once in your life. Whenever you have a polynomial which has a simple root, then Newton's method has a super a super attractor at that fix at that root of the polynomial. However, the sad news is that when the root is multiple, the previous analysis can. So what happened if those two has a common root? If those two has a common root, we will have to actually expand P and make all the calculations by hand cancel everything that repeats itself and see what's happening, what's going on, okay? So forgive me, presenting everything here in one package, but suppose that you have a multiple root, multiple meaning that at least a double root. Let's look, if I have a multiple root, let the root be precisely of order k. 
so that this number, when I evaluate it in the root, is different from zero. Okay, remember that we need to, what was the derivative? The derivative was sort of P of X, second derivative divided by P derivative square, right? So we need the derivative. The derivative here is Leibniz rule. Second derivative, again, Leibniz rule. Right, and now I'm going to put everything together. Right, I'm going to put everything together and I'm going to allow myself to do several calculate, several uh, simplifications, okay? The simplifications that I'm going to do, remember I have to multiply P by, by the second derivative and by this one square. So I'm going to factor all factors of X Z minus C, C zero naught. So the contribution of P is power K. The contribution of the second derivative is you see, k to the minus two. So on top, I will have c my z minus c naught to the two k minus two power, which is precisely the power that appears in the denominator, right? Because here I can pull out z minus c naught k minus k one square is precisely two k minus two. I'm going to cancel them out and I am going to write everything which is left. Here, if, the, if I don't need the power, is Q. In this one, if I pull out this one, X minus X naught, K minus two, I have K minus Q one, Q. Two K, there is one still living. Uh, here there is a Q minus one prime, which is, you forgive me. <laughs> Here, if I pull k minus two, they are c minus n naught squared multiplied by the second derivative. And in the denominator, when I pull out x minus x zero k to the minus one, which was square, I got k cube. Here is one surviving factor, q prime, and remember it is square. Of course, now I can evaluate at C naught. And now I can evaluate at, at C naught and realize that these terms get killed, this one gets killed, and this one gets killed. So therefore, I have the product, this one, multiplied by this, by this, by this, square. And in the denominator, this gets killed, but this gets square. Remember, here there's no more trouble because Q, C naught, is a number different from zero from the beginning. So I cancel them out. I cancel one K and I get here K minus one K. So what was that? Oh, that's the derivative. The derivative where? The derivative of a fixed point. What is called the derivative of a fixed point is multiplier. Is multiplier now is an integer bigger than two divided by well, k minus one divided by k. This is a positive number, right? This number is k bigger than one, so this number is bigger than zero divided by a number which is also bit positive, but it's bigger. So this number is definitely a number which is smaller than one. That is not zero. Therefore, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, suppose that you have a root of, multipl of multiplicity k. Then in Newton's methods, the multiplier of that fixed point is k, k minus one. In particular, when you have at least a double root, you, what you have is that the fixed point is attracting for Newton's method, but it's not super attractive. Because you, in order for it to be super attractive, you need multiplier zero. So therefore, it has an attraction, definitely it has an attraction, but you can claim that this is a very poor attraction. Okay. 
If you think that that was a surprise in Newton methods, there are more surprises in Newton methods that now you can start fully understanding with the techniques of complex dynamics. Let's take a very simple degree three polynomial. If Newton's method is given here, right? Set minus the original polynomial, the derivative of the polynomial. I think that there's no mistake here. However, this dynamical system, which you sometimes remorselessly apply in order to find a root. So that means that you make this, you plug this into your computer, you close your eyes, you find you get a number, you plug it in, and then you several hours later you come from your with, for your printout and it will tell you the root is 27, for example. And then of course you build a ski cropper or you send a rocket to the moon with that solution, and actually either the building falls or actually the rocket explodes. So what's going on? What was going on is that that was not a root. That was the output of the algorithm. And the output of the algorithm not obeys the rules of that you want to find a solution. It obeys the rule that it's actually a dynamical system and it's a dynamical system with its own Fatu setting, with, with its own Julia set. And, let, and let's see what's going on here. This Newton, this Newton method has a super attractor that has not even a root. Evaluate here at zero. And what's the best place to start, right? Best place to start is you're lazy and you don't start with X equals to one or with your solution equals to I, you start with the, the easy one, zero. So you plug in zero. And the first step, you got zero here, you got two on top, minus two in the denominator with another sign, you get one. What happens if you plug in one? If you plug in one, you have in the denominator, in the numerator here, one, in the denominator, one. So you will have one minus one, zero. And you're in loop. You From zero, you go to one, from one, you go to zero. And definitely, Zero nor one are going to be solutions. You say, well, it doesn't matter. If that is not a solution, that's a periodic orbit. It's not only a periodic orbit, it's an attractive periodic orbit. Because in fact, remember what's the derivative? The derivative is going to be function, the second derivative, the first derivative square, right? So what happened with zero? With zero is two. What happened with the denominator? When you take the derivative, the derivative is three squared minus two. When you plug it in zero, you got minus two. What happened with the second derivative? With the second derivative here, you have that the second derivative is six set. And the second derivative is zero. Therefore, you have a super attract. So, what's our conclusions? Our conclusions are that, in fact, Newton's method is good for finding, for finding simple roots, but it's not so good in order if you have multiple roots. Even more, right? The last example shows that Newton's method is not infallible. And in fact, it can fail even in an open set of initial conditions. Because that initial, that open set of initial conditions, I will tell you again, they do not obey the laws of your head that you are interested in finding the root. It obeys the law, the laws of its own dynamical of its own dynamics, and its own dynamics tells us that there is a periodic orbit that picks a critical point, and therefore is going to be super attractive. What else? What's your folklore about Newton method, right? Your folklore about Newton method is how you study possible pitfalls in the application of Newton's methods. And 
study for, for your exams, you learn that, well, if your Newton methods leads you nowhere, just change the solution a little bit and you will converge to a solution. That's true and that is false at the same time. First of all, in our example, we have an open set of initial conditions that lead us nowhere, lead us to a, a super attractor that has no relation with the problem that we want to solve. However, remember a very innocent that you take actually for an easy application of what we were doing is that the Julia set is the boundary of all attractive basins. So now let's put you in this context. Suppose now you are in the Julia set and the Julia set is not empty, right? Because at least you have infinity. So if you are in the Julia set, you are very close to any attraction. So it's not that, the, that any or any small perturbations will lead you to a solution. It tells you that there is a small for any basin or any route that you want to solve, there is a small perturbation of your condition that will lead you to the correct solution. I hope that you have actually enjoyed this, these last examples. Actually, Newton's method actually was applied blindly until actually, I will say until Nowadays, mathematicians that get into this topic rescue a lot of actually hidden properties. Okay, so that's it. And again, the main reference for general complex analysis, we will have Lang's Lang, uh, complex analysis book. And for a more, for the more Modern approach, you will have actually a basic reference, classical reference, you will have the, the, the books of Carlson and Gamelin and John Smilius. Okay, so that's it for today. And tomorrow we will see several other properties that we can infer from the Julia set or, or inferring from the Julia set to, to another and so on. Okay, so I was just on time this time. Thank you very much to Professor Alfredo for the presentation. So, any question? Maybe I have a question. So when, when are you going to publish again your first book on, on complex analysis? Uh, no, that's, a, that's our print. What I'm going to do is actually I'm going to, to put it in, in one and, and, and to put it actually in, in, in the web. If you have actually an electronic version, you're free to circulate it because actually it's not going to be a second printed edition. Okay, thank you. But I hope you have a, one copy. Actually, I have an electronic copy, but uh, it's better to have a book, you know. There, so, there are no, there are no uh, actually copy. Once I found one of those in a second book, in a second boot hand, and I actually I bought it. <laughs> With your university, you, you cannot publish it like easily. Yeah. No, actually, they, they have published it once. And the problem is that there is the math books are actually will be, uh, they have slow selling. And the main problem is storage. So yes. they don't want to print, say, 500 and have in storage for five years uh, a stock of 500 books, right? <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, thanks again to the Professor Alfredo for the presentation. Uh, we have a break. We return at 10 hours.
to the next talk. Please excuse me, may I, may I ask another question? Yes. Um, suppose that I'm interested in, in the dynamics, but not on not a, not on a subset of the Riemann sphere, but say on an elliptic curve. On an elliptic curve, um, uh -huh. is it always possible to lift the dynamic to the to the universal covers, say the hyperbolic disk, and study it there, or do I have to study it intrinsically on the elliptic curve? Well, once you lift it to the to actually, once you lift it to the universal cover, working in an elliptic curve, you will notice that your dynamic well, you will notice that your dynamic is sort of trivial. Oh, is it always trivial on, on an elliptic curve? Mm. Yes, sort of, sort of that. It's sort of trivial in an elliptic curve. It's also trivial in a in an hyperbolic space. Oh, okay, okay. In an hyperbolic space, it's actually governed by Schwarz lemma. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if I'm not wrong, in in Milner's book, there is actually a chapter that tells you about that. So if you take a look at Milner's book, you will find the. Uh, a more precise answer, a written answer, right? Actually, which? Yeah. Thanks, Professor. Okay.
So, continuing with today's program, known is the turn of Lisa Pivas talks entitled Stable Manifolds of Biomorphisms of CN Asymptotic to Formal Groups. groups. Liz Vivas is a professor of, at the Ohio State University. Her research interests are several complex variables, complex geometry, and complex dynamics. So, go for it. So you can start, Professor, please. Perdón, estaba en mute, no me había notado. Uh, buenos días, muchas gracias por la invitación. Uh, una gran organización y, y, y muchas gracias al Profesor Porier y al a Alex Gómez y a todos los encargados de organizar. Uh, voy a hablar sobre stable manifolds of biholomorphisms in several variables. Como mandé el abstract en inglés, voy a hablar en inglés. Um, eh, perdón, tengo que cambiar un poco el, el lenguaje. Um, the, the original title of my talk was a little longer. It was stable manifolds of biholomorphics in terms of CN, the long um, stable, um, formal invariant curve, but that was too long to include it here, so I just included this part. Uh, but let me actually write down here what was the original title, because that's what I will um, basically explain each word on the title and, and start there, okay? So the original, uh, pueden ver lo que escribo, si parece? Estoy segura de que aquí. Sí, sí, sí. Ok. Entonces, este era el título um, original. Perdón, nuevamente. This was the original title. So, um, I will explain what do I mean by um, stable manifolds. When I talk about biholomorphism in CN, we're just talking really about uh, a germ from CN to CN that has a fixed point. And what does it mean for a germ to have a formal curve? And uh, and basically, why why are we interested on this on this specific set up. So let me maybe actually tell you uh, a very quick way to write down the theorem that I will talk about today here. And this is actually a uh, joint work with Lorena Lopez, Hernández, uh, Fernando Sanz Sanchez, Okay, El, the theorem says the following. If you have F, a diffeomorphism of CN with a fixed point zero and gamma is a formal invariant curve. So the, the meaning exactly of what, what does it mean to be a formal invariant curve is that basically there is a formal power series that, uh, that 
after apply F to it, it still stays on that form of power series. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll actually write down here in a little bit, what does it mean? But we want the dynamics on that form of power series to um, have not be repellent. So suppose such that uh, the derivative at the value zero at the fixed point, it's either less than one or it's a rule of unity. Uh, and we uh, don't want actually this to be periodic because if it's uh, periodic, then we'll understand the dynamics there. Then uh, this formal object actually admits an analytic, uh, an analytic object that, act, that in fact it's asymptotic to this formal object. There exists stable manifolds. It, it, it can be actually um, as many uh, as it's possible. It, it, it depends on the degree of certain things for some R. And actually the dimension of this, uh, let me try this. Maybe this is better, okay. Yeah, <clears throat> with, um, dimension of these, each one of them can be between one through n. So it can be actually a curve, a complex dimension, of course, I mean, or it can be a two dimension, et cetera, all the way up to the full dimension of the space in which every orbit is asymptotic to gamma. And in fact, it turns out that every orbit of our uh, diffeomorphism that converges and is asymptotic to gamma eventually has to lie in one of these and one stronger. All right, so I should tell you that uh, this was, had been already done for n equal to, um, I guess this just appeared this year, uh, IMR and N was the same group of authors, but we just mean Ricey, Lorena, Lopez Hernandez, Fernando Sanz, Sanchez, uh, Jasmine Ricey, and Javier Rod. And what we did for the N, this is for any N, basically bigger cotton tree. It's a similar strategy that we are, uh, they had done for n equal two. However, the hard part, the technical problems, was some part of the component on the proof of the theorem, and I'll explain that too. All right, but uh, before I continue, then uh, let me actually motivate a little bit of of this of this setup. Why do we um, need all of these conditions? Why do I mean by formal invariant curve, etc. And please, see if there is any questions at any point, uh, feel free to stop me and ask. Okay, so we change these to this part over here. Okay. So uh, as a remark or as an aside, let's start with um, some background. And actually, some of these uh, I saw that I, probably you will see on the next days on the mini course. Um, uh, I think I, I might repeat actually some things that uh, Professor Bordier said yesterday, but let me uh, give you a little bit of a background of what do we need for, for these parts. Okay, so, and I, in this part, I'm focusing on local dynamics only. So dynamics in dimension one, uh, so let, what do I mean by dynamics dimension one? Again, we are in the same setup. So you have F a diffeomorphism of Cn, in this case, C to zero, and with F of zero equals zero, then by a power series expansion, you know that this F of Z has to be equal to some coefficients times C plus higher order terms. And because it's a diffeomorphism, this A 
cannot be equal to zero. So the existence of a stable manifold here, and by stable manifold, I mean simply a manifold in which every point iterated converges towards that fixed point zero is determined by the multiplier A. So this multiplier A, it's called the multiplier. And depending on what A is, we know um, that the uh, orbits will converge either to the origin or not. So when A is in a modulus less than one, every orbit of F converges to zero, to that fixed point. Then you have the case when A is larger than one, in which actually no orbit of F converges to zero. Uh, let me write here actually uh, when A is a root of unity. I'll write it out as um, next slide. And what's the case that is missing? So what about if the mod of A is equal to one, but A is not a root of unity? Here, the dynamics actually uh, but uh, there's a, two different cases, but when for us that we are interested on orbits converging to zero, the point is that there are not, okay? So no matter which of those two cases that I, I was about to say are, we just know that there are no orbits converging to the origin. These are so by Perez Marco. Okay, so the, the, the cases that we will basically explore or, or that are uh, needed later on, well, every part in which there might be an orbit that converges to zero, it's what I want since we are, we're trying to find um, um, an analytic manifold that does that. So we're, these are basically the two the two possibilities for us, either A less than one or A is a root of unity, are basically the only cases in which we could have, and we do have actually orbits converging to zero. So let me explain a little bit more about the every orbit, um, sorry, the root of unity case. All right, so let's uh, recall what did we have. We had F of C. Okay, f of c equal a c plus higher order term. Order terms. And if a is a root of unity, then either it turns out that capital F is periodic, meaning some iterate of F goes back to the identity, or there exist stable manifolds. And this is just called with a two flowers here. So let me do a little drawing here of this last uh, case. So uh, for example, okay, so let's say f of z is equal to z plus um, say the next order, the next power that you see on your power expansion here turns out to be you know, c cube, okay? And then higher order powers, order of c4. Okay, so the Fallu flat to flower theorem says is basically that you look at the next exponent. So first of all, the first exponent here has to be one, the first uh, coefficient, sorry, has to be one. And that you of course always can get from a rule of unity by taking whatever iterate was here. So if, if A to the um, K is equal to one, then if I take the K iterate, 
I'm going to obtain z plus higher order term. And then I, we can understand the dynamics of this part, and then we understand the dynamics of this. So I'm actually writing an example right now of already an iterate, right? So this is, will be some iterate of f. OK, so f of z equals c plus c q plus order of c to the fourth. So what is here the of a two flower theorem space? It's basically going to say um, that the degree of this, which in this case is 3, we subtract uh, 1, so that would be 2. So this is going to have 2 attracting and 2 repellent regions in which, um, so, okay, let's call the attracting ones the I1, the I2, and the repellent ones the O1, the O2. By I, I mean incoming and out, the O outgoing. Okay, so the picture that one can have in mind here is well, if we think about it, for instance, for Z real, immediately as soon as I start plugging, some uh, values real here. This is just increasing and increasing. And so indeed, it turns out that this is going to be one of my repelling regions. So maybe actually let's do it like this. This is going to be everywhere here. This is D01. And the same thing happens if I take a negative Z, it's going to become more and more negative. So this is going to be D02. And at every point here, things are going further away. But if we take, for instance, Z completely imaginary, so then you're going to have imaginary plus something whose modulus is smaller if it's close to zero. And um, because of the I cube, I will have I squared, so that will be a negative, so it will, it's going to make it closer and closer. So those will be actually going towards the origin. Okay, so this will be the incoming the I1, the I2. And these are the incoming petals. These are the in red, and the other ones were in green. And it kind of always finds it's a little weird to think that uh, how are they, how it turns out that they are um, overlapping. Is it in? going or outgoing at the overlap. But what is really happening at the overlap is that first you are leaving that uh, it, through the green region, basically you are leaving and then you're coming back in some other direction through the red region asymptotically to this line. So at some point it escapes the green region here, sorry, and it goes inside. Okay, um, yeah, it's not a very good drawing, sorry. I should have done it a little bigger. But yeah, think about it like this. It's leaving from here, but coming from here. Okay. The, the, uh, the red regions is what we're calling the stable manifolds. Even so, in most dynamics or in many uh, texts of dynamics, maybe I should write this down. Um, warning or, or remark is that uh, the incoming petals, the I1, the I2, are, um, we are calling stable manifolds. It's more common that in uh, books of dynamics, oh, I see something on the chat. Yes, thanks. In books of dynamics, you'll see um, that many times the, the stable manifolds only are for those ones in which the origin or that fixed point is an interior point. And here, the origin is never going to be an interior point. The origin is going to be actually on the boundary. Um, but uh, the the terminology that we use is the same because we really, um, for CRM theory is really 
the same result if you have uh, some partial some partial uh, for for some formal object in which there is one of these behavior either this fed, fed, uh, flower petal style or or every orbit converges in which is really a, a step a manifold where zero is in, in the interior then for both of them we can obtain a a um, analytic object all right so maybe it's time for me to move on to end your content two Okay, so let me do that. Dynamics in dimension and be very good. Okay, so if we think about F, a diffeomorphism of CN in zero, and we try try to do the same thing well it turns out that now the the multiplier the derivative at zero is not anymore just a number a it's going to be a matrix an n by n matrix and it makes sense that the um, behavior close to zero at least has to be related to the eigenvalues of this matrix uh, and there is some partial results that are similar say all the eigenvalues are modulus different than one then you have that um, depending on how many are less than one, you obtain a stable manifold of that, that dimension, et cetera. But there's many more cases because you can have all combinations of, of, of mods. Oh, so, uh, let me write down whatever I was talking about. The eigenvalues, let lambda one through lambda n be eigenvalues of this matrix B. Okay, so as I was saying, then uh, the partial results that are, are about, uh, we have uh, different combinations, right, of cases. And the I, depending on, on the modulus of the I. And, and um, I'm not gonna write the results that are known, but one case, for instance, that has been focused on, or one way to do it is first, you try to formally linearize these. And for that, there's a lot of uh, resonance uh, problems that can show up if you have that, for instance, uh, some product of your eigenvalues with some powers gives you back one of the eigenvalues, then uh, formally linearizable is impossible. And uh, in the absence of resonance, well, there's again like a, a, a several results uh, there. You have um, results by Poincare that say actually you can analytically linearize. Um, but one case, of course, in which there's too many resonances is when all the lambda i's are equal to one, or they are all roots of unity. Then, of course, there's not a linearization and and I, for instance, have uh, devoted a lot of my time to studying just simply the case in which the derivative is equal to identity, and it's not F an identity. So there is also there are lots of uh, different cases that you can obtain, et cetera. So I'm not going to go in that direction. Instead, suppose that we do have an um, a formal curve gamma for F. So let's write here, suppose, uh, Suppose there exists a formal curve gamma invariant uh, by F for F. Okay. So what do I mean exactly by this? Um, so for, like, maybe uh, I should write this as a definition. <clears throat> By this, I just simply mean an algebraic object, basically, that um, if I think of F simply as, uh, again, also as an, 
as an algebraic object from CN to zero as a basically power and expansion, as the power expansion of the ring of uh, the power series of CN to zero, which is just a ring, then that it should, um, F will be acting there. In, in the same way, I can think of gamma as, as an element of that and um, in what happens for F to plug in there. So let me actually maybe write down explicitly what do I mean for, for example, um, for n equal to, maybe here um, it's possible to write it down at least. And suppose that um, gamma is non-singular, okay? So here I'm just basically, by that I mean that I can write some power like this, gamma of S. The first, um, the first, uh, in the first coordinate, I just write S, and in the second coordinate, it's going to be a power series A1C plus A2S squared plus A3S cubed, and so forth. But what we don't know here is if that this necessarily converge, okay? So this is non necessarily convergent. By that, I just simply mean that we don't have no control over the uh, size of those coefficients, A1, A2, A3, et cetera. And what will it mean um, to be, to be uh, a formal with respect to F? I just simply mean that if I apply F of gamma of S, right? So I, by that, uh, I plug F is going to be different from C2 to zero, from C2 to zero, I should still be on gamma. So this should be still um, belong to or equal to gamma of some data. So that's what I mean by invariant by F. So maybe I should write that invariant for F. And the formal group part it just means some power series of this type. This is, again, this little, I, I, I call this little gamma because I mean by this parametrization of this. All right, any questions, remarks? Okay. Um, Again, there is a way to, to write this down in algebraic terms. Gamma will be a prime idea of the ring of infinite variables. And then as long as the quotient ring has dimension one. But uh, in, in, for us, it really is like write down a parametrization of this type that is formal. And so that uh, the invariance just shows up right here. Okay, that is, is equal to that. All right, so the the, the object that we're looking for is actually a convergent power series. Now we want some convergent power series in which you do have that uh, this uh, part over here is satisfied, and and that is asymptotic to this uh, to this uh, to this formal power series. Okay, so because of the one-dimensional results, of course, if I have that, it's um, it's invariant in this part, you can just think about as the dynamics basically um, restricted to this is a one dimensional dynamics. And from our results that we saw, we definitely have to have that we are either on the attracting case or in the root of unity case. So those are the necessary conditions and that's why they were at the beginning of our theorem that they have to be um, those cases. If not, we can certainly find counterexamples. Okay, so uh, maybe let me write down here necessary condition to find uh, stable manifold for F is that restricted to my 
formal curve to derivative here at the origin should be less than one. Or our word of unity. But remember when to, I had the role of unity case, I had also that it could be that some iterate was the identity. And, and if it's not identity, then I have to look to the forward theorem. So just to make sure that I don't have the identity, I want to make sure that this is not periodic. So we have those three, three um, conditions. And so I already told you like what the, the theorem says, basically the theorem says that um, if the conditions above, then then there exist stable manifolds. M1, M2, M R. Right, with the dimension in, uh, in which every orbit. I don't know if I wrote this before, but um, the, the asymptoticity to, to gamma is important. Okay. All right, so now I guess I can tell you the idea of the proof. And, and the idea of the proof is really like a, in, in some ways, there are several components to the proof. The first component is that if F will have a really nice form in which I have a, a, a form in which I can see the, the power series expansion and maybe from results from one dimension, we know that there is already an analytic stable manifold in one dimension and then from there construct the, the, um, the stable manifold of whatever dimension we have, then, then basically that, that would work. So the, the first step of the proof is basically transform F to a nice normal. Okay, and transforming F to nice normal forms, this is actually um, something that is done in different setups. One way is also using uh, all the work that has been done in, in uh, vector fields. There is also normal forms of vector fields that people study often. Um, and so maybe that's actually a step 1A is to um, connect F which is a diffeomorphism of Cn to a vector field, let's call it capital X, of Cn, of course, itself too, not of, of n dimensions, in which, um, which have a similar dynamics, right? Which are shared dynamical properties. Okay, so let me um, go back to this other. Yeah, and so, and the step two will be once we have this nice normal form F tilde, say, then using F tilde, construct um, the uh, stable manifolds and one through them. Okay, so this is actually a classical way to construct um, stable manifolds or just analytic objects that you want to, them to do something. And in general, it is not possible to do this kind of thing. Why is it possible in this setup? Because we have this uh, gamma curve that is helping us, this gamma formal power series. So in fact, this is not enough for our purposes. What we really need is to transform F gamma, so they both together have along this normal object to some normal form 
related to some gamma tilde too. So all these transformations we share dynamical properties, well, this is independent of gamma, but then when we do this um, first step, the transformation, we do need um, to take into account gamma and whatever behavior we're doing, for instance, in N equal two, what they do is blow up, do not destroy whatever gamma um, it's, it's doing, it, it basically blow up in the right, in the right direction. Once we have this nice setup of gamma gamma tilde, then we will have that it's possible to find these uh, this, uh, analytic objects later on. So I will um, give here some credits. Uh, step one, I guess we uh, inspire, first of all, this uh, finding the, the uh, basically formal vector field. Okay, so step one. So maybe I'll just write down some some of these um, results, partial results, and what do we use? So <clears throat> given f, given capital F, up to an iteration, there exists a formal field Whose time one, whose who's, uh, time one flow is F. This is actually um, our result by Vignamini. All right. So what it's needed now is to show that this vector field again is geometrically significant. So uh, X. These properties of X are quite connected to properties of capital. Okay, so for example, the singular locus of X is going to correspond to formal invariant curves. Of capital and um, attention here. Every time I write something formal, in particular, actually, I should have uh, pointed this out. As soon as you have things that are formal, well, then of course, me different methods of uh, of making these things analytic is using some summability theory, which is in general quite complicated. Or as in this case, we're going to do with step number two, finding some analytic object related to that. Uh, step number two is done by using a uh, Hamanach theorem type of thing, a fixed point theorem. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. But at the moment, again, everything is formal, right? So including my my uh, vector field X. Okay, but even formal vector fields are going to have a nice normal uh, forms. So the next step, or this was step 1a, I guess. Okay, so step now, we continue with step one. And um, use a normal form for x, okay? So not normal form for my capital F instead of normal form for F. Why? Because of what I mentioned that there is uh, reductions of vector fields, these things that have been studied in the past. So uh, we um, apply in N equal to, what they do is uh, use different types of blow up for N bigger or equal than three. Uh, we also have to use besides blow ups things that we call ramifications. Uh, and so this actually has been done by two routine reduction to the vector field X. So again, what does he do? He uses the holomorphic uh, change of coordinates. Blow ups and ramifications. Okay. 
and all together uh, we transform the transformed water field. Is in a convenient reduce form. Now you transform back to your capital F, and um, all this terrestrial reduction gives us is basically a very nice way to write down my, my capital F and gamma. So I'm going to write that down right now. It's a little bit long, but not too long. And then I'll explain from there, how do you find the analytic objects? Okay. This turretin reduction actually uh, was, until literature already um, a place that uh, was, the, I guess, use has been on Rami Sibuya. Um, I to study this again on the context of multisomability of formal objects. Okay. But yeah, it's the construction is actually um, original to the routine. Okay. So what is this convenient redox form? So now um, maybe I'll change colors and uh, let's just write down here in terms of uh, F and gamma. What what this result tells us is basically that there exist coordinates, and uh, one the first coordinate is going to be on C, the next coordinate on C and minus one. So just to denote that the visa vector, whereas x is just one, uh, I'm going to put a, a line in the back, okay? Such that gamma is non-singular. and transverse to x equals zero. And f is of this form. The first coordinate of f, it basically looks like one dimensional object, x minus x to the k plus p plus one, plus order of x to the k plus p plus two. And the second coordinate of F looks um, like an exponential right here. Of course, this is matrix form times Y plus a higher order. And here, what is inside the exponential is going to be X to the K d of x plus xp times c. All right, so this d and this c are both matrices. And k, p, k and p are just constants that come up with different capital Fs will have different Fs. So k or p are just constants uh, larger or equal than zero. The sum has to be larger or equal than one because if not, it wouldn't be a higher degree. D of X is going to be a diagonal matrix. And why did I put the X in front? Because it's actually a polynomials. And the degree has to be at most P. If not, the rest goes over here. Minus one, sorry. Uh, I want to make sure that D of zero is not zero because if not, I could put it with the K. And C is a constant matrix. But importantly, it should commute with D of C, with D. Sorry, I need to include all of that here. Okay, um, let me actually point out some things. This uh, construction, which takes a, a bulk of the of our results, it's um. It shouldn't be confused telling the first coordinate, you just see X, but this order term actually could have elements that are with Y, okay? So it's not that it does not depend on, on Y anymore. This, uh, this part over here can, can contain, uh, and it should contain, in fact, some, some 
some terms of, of y. Only that they are going to be always multiplied by this factor. Same thing down here, this factor also is going to contain terms of y, but at least the first power terms I know that are depending only on x multiplied by this y. As you can notice here, um, 0, y, which will be the x coordinate, is not invariant. Uh, sorry, let me just double check that I'm say I'm, I'm gonna do a little drawing here. So this is my coordinate. This is x, this is y, this is um the the gamma that I have that it is of course uh formal, well, it's not a, an object yet that I, I can find, but this is basically my gamma over here. And again, it's this non-singular part that, that uh, we make the transformation so everything works out this way. Okay, so once we have this, um, this formal normal form, then here is where I apply my results of one dimension. So the results of one dimension say basically, okay, if it will be only, if I will have only this part, then I will know exactly what to do. I have some pedals around there and I understand the behavior of the pedals by plugging in here and see if what does this to the part Y. So the, the hard part of course is to always work with the higher order terms that are here. And so that um, for that, we basically use step number two, which is to use a, a method of Hakim uh, or based on an idea of Hakim, we also use something similar, how to construct basically the um, analytic object. So I'm gonna move on to that now, but maybe before I do that, I'm just gonna copy and paste this. this uh, oh, serious. Okay. This is what we have been studying, or what we will study. And uh, what we want here is to understand again how do we how do we um, how the dynamics of this goes. Okay. So again, you can notice that in the x variable, we have, um, oh, and I should have said, this is all for when the, the, when the restriction to gamma is all the derivative, it's a rule of unity. Uh, when the derivative is less than one, it's easier to, to see that um, my map at the end has to be, it just basically boils down to, um, the hyperbolic uh, theorem in which you have that if, if the eigenvalues are different from one, then you have to have a stable manifold. All right, so sorry. In the x variables here, we have k plus p. Remember, this is just from the from what I mentioned earlier, attracting petals and k plus p repelling petals. On those attracting petals, of course, I'm going to have that x to the k plus p is uh, basically becoming a smaller and closer to real and going towards zero. So um, for one dimensional case, remember that in my one dimensional case, Suppose that this is the attracting pedal. Okay. So, with this. okay, so suppose you have the attracting pedal. The pedal, of course, could be bigger than the circle, but at least in the circle, I, I, we can maybe find that, that at every point here, there is an attracting pedal. At every orbit in this attracting pedal, it turns out that this is converging towards some real line. In this case, the real line is this line. Uh, imaginary line or real coordinate of x equal to zero. So these real lines is what we're going to call 
direction, okay? So this is an attracting, by that I mean just simply in this part over here, is what we call attracting direction. So you suppose that you're in one of the attracting directions, all that is saying is x to the k plus p on an attracting direction. x to the k plus p is real and negative. Okay. So let's call this attracting direction L. And let's say you are in one of these attracting directions L. Let's see what happens with the coefficients of y. Okay. So y is um it's it's this exponential for of that, but let's see what is this that this is really the time one flow of a vector field, or it's very close to being the time one for which vector field. And the vector field that it's here is if you factor x to the k and the, on the power on the, on the numerator here, I mean, the vector field should start with the same uh, degree over here for both parts. Well, I have already the exponential over here. So let's write this down. We have that um, if we use the time one flow of the vector field. And again, I wanted to look very similar to this at the time one, right? So the vector field that I'm gonna use is the one that starts with x to the k, x plus one factor in the first part, is on ddx, and in the second part, what do I need? Well, I'm gonna need this exponential, so whatever I write on here. So all I'm gonna write here is dx times x to the pc, y, ddy. Okay, so this is a vector. These are matrices, it's a vector. So this is going to be basically, um, if we study this time of flow, then uh, we use this as a toy model for our normal form above. Okay, and now just by looking at these, again, the directions in which this is is going to to zero is going to be x to the k plus p real less or equal than zero, and studying the orbits of this is not hard since it's such a simple map. The orbits of these vector fields are what are. Um, if we plug again here, what, what should it be? It's just simply going to be, of course, the quotient of this divided by that, the integral and the kind of exponential. The x to the k almost doesn't, well, it does not play a role for, for looking at the orbit, so you just have that this is going to be the, the, um, the orbits, okay? And now, of course, the behavior around L when X is one of those lines depends very much on the coefficients, on the first coefficients of, of these, uh, of the real part of these matrices. The X is the smaller matrix, so the behavior um, around my attracting direction L, of course, depends on the real part because the mod of the exponential is exponential of the mod of, of the real part of the exponent and that real part is uh, what we need here. Next. Okay, so maybe I have some more minutes. I'll um, actually say two more things. Basically what, um, let me think about what else shall I say before I end? So maybe I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. How do we get the number of, of, of um, 
every one of these table manifold has a dimension. So some of them have a smaller dimension than others. What does that depend in how many real parts are positive or negatives? Okay, so that's basically one, one thing that I just wanted to mention. Um, depending on number of positive real parts, we obtain um, the dimension of this analytic object that I mentioned. But uh, I haven't yet really gone yet to the step number two, and maybe I'll just uh, mention this step number two. How do we do it? So far, we have been toying with just um, a, a, a toy, we have been just using this, this very basic model to see what happens. And then from that example, we see, oh, this is what should happen when you have this, um, this uh, uh, only as, 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 a, as an idea of the, of the whole uh, complex, more, more complete model. So what we really have to do here is, um, for the step number two is really use my full F, right? So my full F, maybe I can just do a paste again here, was like this. So I have these order terms. What we do here is separate this, this part over here. I'm gonna separate this Y part into the parts that are going with the right, a real part positive, and the parts when they are going with the real part negative, because one of them is going to be the attracting part and the other one is gonna be the repelling part. So let me actually paste this twice. What we want to forget is, is all about the why, instead of having um, two like this, I just wanna have one, Sorry, instead of having one Y, I'm gonna separate it in two parts that are going to depend again on which parts have our real part positive or not. So let me actually separate my Y as W and C. Okay, so Y again is gonna depend on those two parts. And here is going to be two different matrices. It's going to be D1 and C1, and here D2 and C2. So let's write that down. D1 of X plus C1, XP C1, and D2 of X plus XP times C2. Okay, and so here I'm also separating these parts. This is going to be with respect to the variables W and respect to the variables C. So again, I'm just checking. There is uh, some parts in which I have D1 is basically of X uh, is such that the real parts of certain coefficients, some coefficients are all negative and D2 of X is otherwise. Okay, so now I know exactly in which part should be a good um, behavior that is attracting. It's just on those first two coordinates. So my stable manifold is going to be basically, if the world will be ideal, there wouldn't be a W. Nothing uh, there will then be a C coordinate. Everything will be X comma W comma zero, and that will be it. But uh, what we really have is some graph over that. So what the stable manifolds end up being is a graph given by a graph of this type. Okay. And where? Well, not over the whole uh, x comma w, over like a small part in which I can obtain um, attraction for, for all, those, all those orbits. And it turns out what we need here is a domain of the following form. Well, first, um, I want to make sure that I'm on the right dimension. That's the S that comes from. X is going to be a pedal, incoming pedal, belonging to incoming pedal. And W is small compared to X to the right power, say, X to the M. For some M well chosen that I 
haven't mentioned here, but again, you just choose that and what chosen. And now, how do I do the final construction to find all we need now is to find this. I write like I'm saying all we need, but that's the hard part. We need precisely to find who is this um, this map. And for that, we find uh, this uh, as a fixed point. And again, this is um, kind of classic now in this setup. The, the fixed point that you use is basically, well, you use a map that is acting on curves or on curves of, that are our own graphs, basically. So to any graph, what this map does is uh, it acts on for any given point, it's going to act as a, basically, you you do here, what does it have to do for this to be um, fixed point for F? Well, it, what we we'll have to do is um, act as a telescopic sum in some ways and making sure that the next orbit minus next orbit, all of those things cancel out. So maybe I'll just write it quickly. This is going to be, you apply E, where E is a well-chosen, um, basically the exponent, this uh, are up there that I mentioned of like the, the real, uh, in the toy model, the, the part that really goes to, to the orbit, how the orbit will be. Well, that's why you apply here, the orbit, and here you're gonna apply five of xj, wj, e to the xj minus one, minus, um, let's call this F3. This is the, the term that sh shouldn't be there that I wanted basically to cancel out all the time. Xj plus one. Okay, so it turns out the, where Xj and Wj are of course the, the orbits, the first two orbits of, of um, of F, right? This plus one plus one. And this is the projection on the first two coordinates. But I mean, not two coordinates, but on the projection on the X coordinates and the W coordinate. And, and, and so it, it is, um, it is, a, again, this, I'm not explaining it very precisely or, or to the full extension, but basically it turns out that for phi to be a fixed point of T happens if and only if this phi is invariant. Now everything is analytic. My, my domain, I make sure that um, the space in which I consider this T is going to be a uh, Banach space. I make sure that there, uh, my T is a contraction, and therefore it's going to have a fixed point, and therefore uh, I can get at that fixed point. That was an analytic object. It's indeed an invariant curve. Um, and so, therefore, we obtain these stable manifolds that we want. Okay. All right. I'm going to end here. I have to teach in a little bit, so. Thank you very much. Gracias. So thanks you very much to the professor Liz for the presentation. Any question? Well, uh, thanks again to the Professor Liz for the presentation. Now uh, we have a break. Uh, we return at 15 hours. Okay.
So continuing with today's program, now is the turn of Julio Jos talks entitled Core Entropy along the Mandelbrot set and Truston's master title. Julio Tioso is a professor at the University of Toronto. His research interests are dynamical system and ergodic theory with applications to complex analysis and geometry group theory. So Julio, uh, go for it. Okay, so how about this way? Yeah. I hope there's no return. That's only the slightly problem for this. Yeah, I guess it's okay. Okay, perfect. Is it working now? Awesome, thanks. Okay, so let me first start. Yeah, so let me first start by talking about this. Um, yeah, so let, let me first start by um, introducing the notions of entropy that we're going to discuss. So there are several notions. So one is just the usual topological entropy. And then there are um, notions for complex dynamics. So these are called the notion of core entropy. And I will also recall a few ideas about um, general complex dynamics, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to talk about um, the so-called entropy spectrum, which was defined by Thurston. So sometimes it's called also Thurston set. And you might have seen these pictures, which look like bagels. And then we're going to go from bagels to teapot, so which is another object that Thurston des described. And we're going to try to describe the geometry. So if I'm not mistaken, this talk is uh, kind of long, so it could be even 90 minutes or so. Maybe uh, after a little, I will present all the results and then I will have some more time to discuss some part of the proof. And this, the proofs have a lot to do with combinatorics and, and just graph theory, basically, in fact. Okay, so by the way, let me start with noticing that Toronto and Lima happen to be on the same meridian. So I didn't know this. So Lima is on the Pacific coast and Toronto is close to the Atlantic coast, but um, so it looks like. So unfortunately, I cannot visit this beautiful country and I cannot taste the nice cuisine, but uh, still, we're still together somehow. Okay, so what is topological entropy? So, well, you guys probably have studied at school and, you know, if you took in, at university, if you took some course in dynamical system, the following notion of um, topological entropy, which is the following. So you take a continuous map of a compact, say, metric space or Hausdorff space, and then you have some covers. So you take some finite cover, and you want to know how many items in a cover is it needed to cover your space. So if you have some strange space, you have some bunch of open sets that cover it, and you count how many do you need, and then the idea is you take pre images of this by their dynamical system. So that's the standard definition. And I will show you that maybe there are some more intuitive definitions. So this, of course, is correct and, and very general. But in fact, we will be only interested in 
basically real and complex quadratic polynomials. And so there are other ways to interpret the topological entropy of such systems. So let's me, let me go to the first notion of topological entropy. So if you have just a continuous real map, so maybe a quadratic polynomial, so the picture looks like this. It's usually like a parabola. And the interpretation of entropy that is given due to results of Mishulevich and Slank is just the following. So you can count how many intervals it takes. So to describe this function in a way, so basically you call a lap is an interval on which the function is monotone. And then you count how many there are. So in this case, there will be one lap like this and one lap like that. So you would have two of them. But if you iterate the map, you will have some more folding. And then you can ask how many does it take for the nth iterate? And so that's the idea. So in fact, you take the nth iterate of this map and then you take the log of that because you know this is a iterative procedure that usually should produce some exponential exponentially growing uh, system, um, sequence and so then you take this limit so let's give it a try so this is the first one we have two laps now if i have the second iterate how many laps do i have Or, right, yeah. Okay, so what about the next next one? Just count how many laps do you have? I have one, two, three, four. No, oh, sorry. Got confused as well. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it looks like every time is doubling. Well, it at most can double. So let's see if we do the next one. How many do we have here? Yeah, it's 14. Yeah, it's it's not 16, but rather 14. Yeah, that's right. So it can at most double, but doesn't always double. And depends on the map, you will see more folding or less folding. So if you see more folding, you have more entry. That's the idea. And so, yeah, you can keep doing this. Uh, it's a yeah, good luck with counting how many there are here. But the nice thing is here, this limit always exists because this is uh, basically just a sub-additive sequence. So you can, uh, by general principle, say that this limit exists. So that would be the first interpretation of entropy, which is good because it always exists. The downside is that we cannot quite compute it very easily. You have to take this infinitely many iterates, so it's kind of time consuming. So another way to compute entropy, which you probably have seen in maybe if you studied some dynamical systems of various sorts, is the following. So in a special case, when your map is postcritically finite, so what does it mean that the map is postcritically finite? It means that the forward orbit of the dynamics of the critical points is finite. For instance, you could have an interval map. You have a critical point that maps here, maps here, and after three iterates, maps back to itself. So when you, these are particularly nice situations. And in this case, you can explicitly compute the entropy by taking some eigenvalue of certain matrix. So here's an example. It's exactly the same as before, in fact. So here we have this map with a critical point of period three. So in fact, the critical point is here. If you follow it along on the graph, you see that you go here, you come back and back now. And so this 
basically gives rise to a partition of your interval into subinterval A and B. And we can encode the transition of this by saying that A maps to A union B. Basically, it's like this. So you have A and B. And the image of A is A union B. And the image of B, well, the image of B is just A, basically. So the image of B is just A. And so we can write a matrix like that because there's two entries. So we assign one entry to A, one entry to B. So we have one and one, and one and zero because there's no B. And then you take powers of this matrix and you look at the leading eigenvalues. In fact, in this particular case, it's a very well known what the leading eigenvalue is. In this case, you get the golden mean. And the reason why this is uh, quite uh, nice is because in this particular case, if you take powers of this matrix, so if you call M this matrix, if you have the nth iterate to the nth power of this matrix, the entries are going to be Fibonacci numbers, precisely. So I think, uh, yeah, you're going to get, uh, I'm, I'm sure, something like Fn plus 1, Fn, Fn, Fn minus 1, something along this line. This is precisely the Fibonacci recursion. And so, of course, uh, it's well known that the growth rate of Fibonacci numbers is the golden mean, so square root of 5 plus 1. And then to do the entropy, where well, we just take the log of that. So entropy, e to the entropy is this number lambda. So sometimes we're going to refer to h as entropy. And this lambda, sometimes we're going to call the growth rate, because sometimes we like to, to work with these algebraic numbers. But basically, they encode the same information. One is just the log of that. Are there any questions so far? Everything's fine? Yes, Professor. Yes. Okay. Everything okay. Very good. So, by the way, so, okay, so let's keep going. So, now, what is classically one problem that uh, lots of people consider is when you have a one parameter family of dynamical systems, you can ask, does entropy change and how does it change when you change your parameter? So, of course, the most famous one parameter family for complex dynamicists is the family z squared plus c. So z is your, uh, you know, element in the dynamical plane and c is a parameter. So c maps to z squared plus c and c is a parameter. So you want to change maybe this parameter you get for every c, you get a different dynamical system. And so this is precisely what Milner and Thurston considered in the late 70s. And they proved this famous theorem. So if you look at the entropy as a function of your parameter, well, the function is continuous and monotone. In fact, this picture is precisely a picture from their paper from 77. And they have a slightly different normalization. So now we prefer to work with fc of z equals z squared plus c. But at the beginning, people looked at what's called the logistic family. So they had fa of x equals a times x times 1 minus x. But these two families are conjugate to each other, just a different normalization. So basically, it's the same. And so you get this entropy picture here. So here they plot s. So s is e to the entropy. So this is what I called lambda. So the entropy goes from 0 to log 2. And so this growth rate goes from 1 to 2. And you observe that this map has a, so the, the entropy function is monotone, is continuous, is not smooth. In fact, well, it's not completely clear, but you can kind of guess that there are some sort of, uh, there's some sort of little spikes somewhere. It's, it's hard to tell exactly, but it doesn't, doesn't look very smooth. And also it has plateaus. So basically there are some places where this is flat. So this entropy function looks a little bit like a devil's staircase in some sense, except that it's, it's actually not homogeneous at all. So 
this is a somewhat the classical um, theory, which is of course uh, very well developed and uh, still there are still things that are not completely understood, but uh, mostly understood. And then what is the main goal of what I've been working on for a long time is whether we can extend it, this kind of theory to complex polynomials. So instead of real polynomials to complex ones. And this of course, this was also uh, motivated by some um, ideas of Bill Thurston in the last years of his life that he in fact came back to this problem 40 years later and then he was making progress on it and unfortunately he died prematurely so we still have to complete somehow what, what, he, what he started. But. So how do we extend this theory to complex polynomials? Well there is a first sort of uh, easy way to think about it but it's a bit uh, disappointing in some sense. So we could think of a map which is complex polynomial as a map of the sphere. So C hat, which is, this is just a Riemann sphere. So if you think of a complex polynomial of a map as a map of a sphere, the entropy is always log of the degree. And the reason is pretty simple is because if you take a point except for a couple of very special points, the number of pre images is always the same. It's always uh, the degree. This is just a, like a fundamental theorem of algebra. While, you know, if you do it in the reals, uh, the number of real pre images uh, can change, and that creates this complicated um, function and this interesting dynamics and interesting invariance. So considering just this map as a map of the sphere is kind of interesting, but uh, in this uh, one dimensional case is somewhat limited. So we have to find a new um, replacement for the real line. Okay, so now let's go a little bit into basic complex dynamics that might you might have heard of before, but okay, let's go slightly to, to go back to some of this uh, notion. So first of all, the most important, most famous set in complex dynamics is the Mandelbrot set, which is the set of parameters C, such that if you iterate the point zero for this map FC of Z, the orbit of zero, which is the critical point, is bounded. So if the orbit is bounded, you color the points in black and you get this fractal set. And if the orbit escapes, you color it in a color which depends on how fast it escapes. So in red, it escapes faster and then in yellow, it escapes slower, but still it escapes. And so that's how you get this famous picture. And of course, the geometry of the set is in some sense well understood, but also, you know, object of many famous conjectures. So also let me recall a little bit of fundamental things in complex dynamics and in the Mandelbrot set. So the Mandelbrot set has hyperbolic components. So these bubbles, so to speak, that are in the Mandelbrot set are called hyperbolic components. So they're characterized by the property that the critical point, if you pick a parameter in that bubble, converges to a periodic cycle, an attracting periodic cycle. And so, of course, this periodic cycle can have different periods, basically. So, so the set of hyperbolic polynomials, so the polynomial for which the critical point converges to an attracting cycle is open, and you have all these components. And then the components are characterized by the period because every polynomial in the same component has the same period. And you can even, uh, by taking the, multiplier at this attracting periodic point, you can uniformize this hyperbolic component. And then these components have naturally a center, which is a point for which the critical point indeed is purely periodic. So, and also they have a root, which is where the, critic, where the multiplier is one. So they correspond to a polynomial with a parabolic periodic point. So maybe it's better to Look at the picture that you might have seen. So if you look at the main cardioid of the Mandelbrot set, this corresponds to period one. So corresponds to polynomials with an attracting fixed point. And then you have the component index by two is where you have an attracting period two uh, cycle. And then uh, you notice that there is a way to go from one to two, you can cross 
And this is the usual, the, the well-known period doubling phenomenon where you can deform a critical, uh, attract, attract, sorry, an attracting cycle in an attracting cycle of period two and so forth. And of course, and then you can go from period two to period four. And however, for a period higher than two, there are more than one component with the same period. So period is not enough to uh, pin down the component. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So, and also the other nice thing about the Mandelbrot set is that the Mandelbrot set is really complicated, but the complement of it, in a sense, it's kind of simple to understand. And the reason is because we have this miracle of the Riemann mapping. So we can construct quite easily the uniformization, the uniformizing map for the outside of the Mandelbrot set. So you take, uh, you, on the right, you see the Mandelbrot set. You take the exterior of the Mandelbrot set. The exterior is biholomorphic to the exterior of the unit disk. And that's very useful because, of course, we can understand the exterior of the unit disk pretty nicely. And that tells us a way to you know, index points in, in the Mandelbrot set, or at least conjecture. So in particular, you have what are called rays because I can have polar coordinates on the left. So for instance, I can have a ray of fixed angle. And if you map it to the other side, you're gonna get a ray in the outside of the Mandelbrot set. And then the deep and uh, yeah, deep and interesting question is whether there is a limit as you go towards the boundary, is there actually a well-defined limit of this external ray? And that's in fact related to the famous MLC conjecture that we will state in a second. And so, yeah, so this is the, the definition of external rays, as I said, so for every theta, so you can think of theta as, 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 as an angle here, you can get a ray on the other side and if the ray lands, if there is a point in the limit. And yeah, it's, uh, this of course uh, goes back to the landmark uh, or say notes of the Adin Hubbard. So they first proved that if you start with an angle which is rational, so meaning that it's a rational multiple of pi. So we, we forget about the pi in the complex dynamics. Usually we just say that the angle is rational if it's a rational multiple of pi, then the external ray lands. And in fact, it determines a postcritically finite quadratic polynomial. Well, the, the postcritically finite polynomial is not always the point where the ray actually lands. So if it lands, on the boundary of a hyperbolic component, you have to go to the center of such components. So there is a little bit to be said there, but basically there is a map of theta from, from theta rational number to F theta, this is a polynomial. Yeah, so something like this. And in fact, yeah, in fact, uh, if, uh, if uh, theta is of the form P over Q where Q is even, this ray lands at a parameter which is pre-periodic, so for which the critical point is pre-periodic, which is called the Mizurevich parameter. And if the Q is odd, then it lands at the boundary at the root of some hyperbolic component. And so we got, we take the center of such component. So that's basically the only thing you have to take care of. So for instance, if I take the angle three over seven, which I like a lot, you know, the ray lands at the root of the component and this component is the airplane component. So the dynamics of the corresponding center is like this, is exactly as I told you. Any questions so far? This part is sort of a either review or <laughs> completely new, depending on what you, you know about this subject. Okay, and so the famous conjecture is that in fact, this uh, map extends continuously to every, even the irrational angles. So there is actually a map from the boundary of the 
unit disk to the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. And that, if that is true, then the Mandelbrot set can be obtained by quotienting the closed disk. So remember that basically there is a map from the outside of the disk to the outside of the Mandelbrot set. And then if it extends to the boundary, then you can, you can uh, consider the boundary of the Mandelbrot set as a quotient of the disk. You have to just remember when two rays land together. So maybe there are two rays like this one and this one, they might land at the same point. So maybe there's a little bit of Mandelbrot set here. And you have to remember that, but once you remember that, you understand completely the topology of the Mandelbrot set. Okay, so the other, the other thing that we have to care to define is the Jules, Julia sets. So Julia sets are, uh, have a similar definition to the Mandelbrot set in some sense, but for each C, there is a different one. So you start with the parameter C and the fill Julia set is the set of points which do not escape to infinity under iteration. So the orbit is bounded and the Julia set is just a bound. So of course you might've seen this picture. So the blue part is the Julia set and then the fill Julia set would correspond to the blue and then you have to fill in these components like that. And then the Fatou set is the complement of the Julia set. And the other nice thing is that you can also have external rays in the exterior of the Julia, of the fill Julia set, much like we do for the Mandelbrot set. In fact, it's a bit easier in some sense. So the exterior of the disk maps to the exterior of the Julia set. So as before, so we have a picture like we have a zero of a disk, and we have this Julia set like that, and we can map the exterior to the exterior, so we can have rays in the exterior of the disk that maps to the exterior of this Julia set. And what is really interesting is that this map kind of is kind of easy to understand in the sense that it conjugates or the dynamics. So here on the right hand side, your dynamics is just this complex polynomial. And on the right hand side, the dynamics is just the square map, z goes to z square. So this ribbon map conjugates these two dynamics on the outside of the Julius. And so this makes it somewhat easy to understand combinatorially this uh, complex uh, quadratic dynamics. Any questions? Okay, and the last object that I want to review, which you might not have seen, but it's really interesting and fits in what I'm gonna talk about later is this lamination that Thurston constructed. So we discussed earlier that if this MLC conjecture is true, then you can interpret the Mandelbrot set as a quotient of the disk. And this lamination makes you able to remember what are the identifications that you have to do to do that. So basically, you, you, the lamination is an identification of points on the disk. So you start with the disk, and you pick two boundary points. This corresponds to two rays, theta 1 and theta 2. And then you look at the exterior of the Mandelbrot set. And you, you look at these two rays. So Theta one maybe land in this particular case, I think theta one would land here and theta two would land here. So they land together. So we remember that by saying that in the lamination, we insert a leaf like that. 
In fact, the red ones are the ones that correspond to the real axis. So if you pick another point here, theta three, which is identified with something on the other side, let's say theta four. So these guys are identified if these two points, theta three, these two rays, theta three and theta four, land at the same. And the same it can be done for a complex one. So if you take two rays with angles that such that the rays land together, say one seventh and two seventh. So these two these two rays will land together here, for instance, and you record that. So this would be I don't know, theta five and theta six. And you record this identification by, by drawing the image. So this is a way to combinatorially really capture what is this combinatorics of the mandibles. And again, if this conjecture is true, the MLC conjecture, then this is a faithful representation. It's absolutely a homeomorphism with, between the quotient of this lamination and the Mandelbrot set, as, as we defined it at the beginning. But this is still a conjecture. So. Okay, so this is uh, the sort of background. Now, what we really care about is entropy. So how do we define entropy? So remember that in the real case, we took a real map and we consider the action of a real map on the real interval. And in a complex case, there is no real interval, but there is a tree, which is called the Hubbard tree. So what is the Hubbard tree? Well, basically you pick the critical point and its orbit, its forward orbit, and you join elements in this orbit in all possible ways. So let's let's see what it is. So you start with a Julia set has here, and we have a critical point. So the critical point in this case is here. And if we forward, if we iterate forward the critical point, you're gonna have that the critical point in this situation goes like this. In this case, it's postcritically finite. They have only four points in the postcritical orbit. And what do you do? You can join this point by some arc. And this arc has to be canonical in certain ways. So it's called the regulated arc. So what happens is this one. So you see that you can get the tree like structure, this red, uh, sorry, this black Y shaped um, tree. This is uh, called the hub. So this is a very important definition. So maybe if you, if you have doubts, it's a really good time to ask. And so what happens is that uh, what's nice about this is you have this tree. And then the map, this uh, polynomial, preserves the tree. So the tree maps into itself under this um, polynomial map. So FC of TC maps into this. So one might ask under which conditions really this holds. So for sure, if, this if the polynomial is postcritically finite, that is definitely true. But even if the Julia set is locally connected, well, you can still produce such a tree, except maybe this tree could be an infinite tree. So it could have infinitely many branches. And so that creates a little bit more complications, but you could still define. But mostly we're gonna be interested in the case where you get this finite tree. And so now we understand that we could define an entropy by taking the restriction of this map to the tree, and then you take just the entropy. And so that's exactly what Thurston defined. So you start with a polynomial whose Julia set is connected and locally connected. For instance, a postcritically finite one. 
And then you define the core entropy as the entropy of the restriction of this map to the tree. So you see for every, so you start with the polynomial, you have a tree and you have the map on the tree and you have the entry. So that's the fundamental object. And this is called the core edge. So maybe we can see an example of how to compute it in the say period four case, also known as Cocopelli. So in this case, we have a period four critical orbit and the easiest way to compute the entropy is just to compute the matrix as we did for the airplane before. So in this case, maybe you are familiar or not with complex dynamics. So here, this is the critical point. So the critical point maps here, maps here, maps here, and maps here. So here's a exercise for you. So if I start with the segment A, where does it map? Yeah, it maps to B, that's right. How about B? B maps to C, very good. How about C? Okay, so C is a bit tricky because uh, you should uh, realize, so this is a fixed point. So in fact, the C, stretches all the way and covers A and B when you map it forward. So C maps are to actually two things, A and B. And now how about D? So D maps to A for sure, but not just A, because if you look at this point. Union B. Yeah, exactly, Union B. Right, so it's important in fact that uh, there is at least some ver edge which is mapped to two, or two other edges because otherwise uh, there would be no entropy. So uh, the entropy would be zero all the time. So there has to be some fold in some. Okay, so this is indeed the transition. And then we can construct a matrix. This time it's four by four matrix. And we can take the characteristic polynomial. And the characteristic polynomial has some eigenvalues and you take the leading eigenvalue and you get this map. And then of course you take the log of it and you take the F. So that's a canonical example to compute pretty explicitly the core entropy. But of course for each rational, you have to compute the tree and from the tree do the matrix from the matrix the polynomial and the eigenvalue of course this would be uh, really really painful to do all the time so there there will be shortcuts and we will see algorithms that in fact Thurston himself uh, came up with to make this easier or like a better to compute okay so in general the question of Thurston was, okay, I start with this rational um, number and I construct this post-critically finite polynomial. I look at the landing point of the ray. And then I have a polynomial, I have a tree, and I take the entropy on this map on this tree. And this is gonna be considered as a function of this theta. So it will be a number associated to each rational. And this will be the core. And so the question that Thurston was interested in, or one of them, was that how does H vary with this parameter theta? And so here's the famous picture that he drew. So what, what is this picture about? So basically you have the coordinate theta here and the entropy on the y. And in fact, you see, of course, that there is a very interesting fractal structure already, which 
is not that surprising as it should relate to the Mandelbrot set. But of course, maybe it's not so clear at this moment how this relates to the Mandelbrot set. So in fact, the way, so this is of course uh, symmetric, so we could just take half of it, that would be kind of enough. Of course, the question that I like to phrase is, can you see the Mandelbrot set in this picture? And of course, at this point, you might not be so trained in doing so, so it could be a bit of a problem, but I will show you how, how to relate this fractal picture to the structure, the fractal structure of the Mandelbrot. So in fact, uh, there are many observations. So first of all, the first observation is that if two angles land together, they have the same entropy, right? So if you go back here, well, now it's not so easy to see, but basically you could pick in the Mandelbrot set If we pick two rays such that land together, so for instance, one seventh and two seventh, so those correspond to two different points in this graph. Maybe one seventh is around here and two seventh is around here. And the entropy has to be the same because they represent the same map except just with a different angle. Well, in this case, it is the case that both have entropy zero. So it's, yeah, they, they have the same entropy and in this case it's zero. If you go further, if you go to, I don't know, say for instance, you go to the airplane component, you get three seven and four seven. Well, you will see that at some point there is, uh, I don't know exactly where it is, but maybe a point, you know, maybe this one, which is three seven. And then it, four sevenths is bigger than one half, so there will be on the other side another point with the same. So this is the one thing that obviously has to be true. And also the other thing is that there is a monotonicity. So in the classical case, there was monotonicity in the sense that if you go, wait, if you go from the main cardioid towards the tip of the Mandelbrot set. So the Milner Thurston theory tells you that you have this function for the real parameters. So this is this function that we saw before. So the function is increasing as you go from the center of the Mandelbrot set to the tip. So in fact, the, the entropy was going to be zero at the cusp and it's increasing and it's log two at the tip. So the entropy function is increasing. In fact, uh, the picture that I showed you should increasing to the right instead of to the left because of the, the parameterization. But this entropy function of Milner and Thurston tells you that this is increasing. And in fact, the same is true for the Mandelbrot set, if you go towards the tips of the Mandelbrot set, so you start from the center and uh, you go along it, along what's called the vein. So vein is an arc that gets you to the tip of the Mandelbrot set. For instance, I go to this tip and the entropy is increasing as you keep so this was already observed by a student of Milner, Li Tao, and by Chris Penrose some decades ago, but then, yeah, when Thurston started working on this, there were more general proofs by Tan Lei and then Tsang Jin Song, who's a student of Tan Lei. So this is, uh, again, the complex version of a monotonicity of it. But maybe you still don't believe me that this entropy really is increasing along veins or is related to the Mandelbrot set. So maybe I can actually show you another another picture, maybe even more convincing.
Okay. So this is the picture of our core entropy. But in this case, this has been plotted as a function of the parameter C, not of the parameter theta. So this is a more classical picture of the Mandelbrot set. So, so the C parameter is on the plane, and then the vertical parameter is the entropy. And the colors tell you how big the entropy is. So you can see that in the main cardioid, you have this purple, means the entropy is zero. And actually in this other components attached to the cardioid, still the entropy is zero. So if you do finitely many components that are attached to the main cardioid, so if you just uh, go to, work, to the components that are immediately attached to them, then the entropy doesn't change. So there is a large region where this entropy is zero, but not everywhere, of course. As you keep going, the entropy, in fact, is increasing. Also, I must say that the, the values of this entropy outside the Mandelbrot set are really not defined, but uh, somehow this uh, just mathematically just interpolates, so you get this tight surface, but there's a little bit of cheating in that. But what's kind of neat, I think, is that, for instance, if you look at the profile of this peak, of this uh, somehow surface, so if you just uh, somewhat take take the horizontal um, picture of it, so you see that you have a picture that the, the silhouette that you see is the same as the Milner and Thurston uh, function, the one that I showed you a few slides before. You see that there are some plateaus and there are some strange non-smoothness here. And of course, this is the same function. I mean, the function is constant for a long time, but then it, it, it keeps going. And then the interesting thing is if you go to the other veins, so if you go to the side of the Mandelbrot set instead of to the tip to the left, so you go to the step, for instance, you also see that this entropy is increasing. So this is one way to visualize this monotony. Any questions about things that you want to know about this function? Or... Okay, so let me stop then. Okay, so I'll just go back to sharing from here. Oh, there's questions in the chat? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I have to, yeah, 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 you have to find the centers of the, yeah, so, so computing the entropy, I will show you how to compute the entropy. That's one thing. So if I give you the external rate, uh, angle, there is an algorithm that I will tell you to compute the entropy. On the other hand, you have to compute the location of the center of the certain hyperbolic component, and that also can be done by solving some polynomial, but of course the degree gets really large. So yeah, that, that's also slightly complicated, but yeah. Okay, so the other thing that, yeah, the entropy is also related to what's called the, by accessible angles. So basically it's also, proportional to the dimension of my accessible angle. So these are um, sets of angles that are considered by many people. For instance, Zacharias, Mernos, Dunik, and Schleicher. So remember that we have these identifications and uh, angle is by accessible if basically there is another angle for which the two rays land at the same point. So again, in this identification, oh, no, for, the, for the Julius in this case. So if you do something like that, that's your, yeah, that's your Julia set, then you, you, you have two rays landing together, theta and eta, and they're biaccessible. 
And the dimension of my accessible angles is usually less than one. And in fact, it's equal to the core entropy divided by log two. Log two is related to the fact that this is a degree two polynomial. So the maximum of entropy is log two. And that in fact is true when you go to the tip of the mandible set. And in that case, you're gonna see dimension one. So one of the questions that were asked about this was this famous, so to speak, dispute between Thurston and Hubbard, whether this, can, this function is continuous. And of course, there are some variations, it's never completely clear uh, the, the precise question, but one way to interpret it is that you have this function defined on the rationals, as I said before, and the question is, can we extend this function to continuous? In fact, that's what I proved a few years back, that this entropy function does indeed extend continuously as a function from the circle. So because this is the circle of infinity of the Mandelbrot set, so R mod Z to R. So this picture really represents faithfully this entropy function. And in fact, it's also more interesting than that because there are local, local regularity properties of this function, which are very interesting. For instance, the core entropy is held there most of the time, but not always. So is locally held there when the entropy itself is positive and not locally held there when the entropy is zero. So if you see in this picture, you have places where the entropy is zero and these are related to the main cardioid and everything attached to the main cardioid, so the main molecule. And this function is globally continuous, but when it's, the entropy is zero, the modulus of continuity of this function is really bad. So this function grows very, very rapidly away from this uh, points where it's zero. So the entropy makes a huge jump. On the other hand, when you're at the point where the entropy is bigger, like here, for instance, you look at in a neighborhood and this map is much more regular. So it's locally held or continuous. And in fact, there's even a more precise way to characterize this regularity because indeed you have the following that uh, basically should hold all the everywhere, but let's certainly, certainly I proved for, for real. Certainly I proved for real quadratic polynomials. So, so the, the fact is the following quite surprising fact that if you look at the local Herder exponent, so you, you, you have this function, so this is a fractal function, <laughs> you zoom in at some place, like at some point theta, and you look at the local Herder exponent. So what is the best exponent for which you have the Herder condition? And the local Herder exponent is indeed equal to the value of the entropy up to this uh, constant log two. So this is precise state. So this speaks to the very inhomogeneous nature of the Mandelbrot set. That basically, if you look at a piece of it, you can almost tell where you are because if you look at this, this entropy function, you zoom in locally and you can recover the entropy itself. And that doesn't quite recover, of course, the position in the Mandelbrot set, but already gives you a lot of information. Of course, there's also this uh, philosophy that if you look at the Van der set locally, you recover the geometry of the Julia set, the corresponding Julia set. So this, of course, has been um, considered before many times. So in some sense, it's not completely surprising, but it's, a, it's an instance of that. Okay, so this is basic general presentation about the entropy. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, in fact, this was a, also conjectured independent, uh, yeah, in a paper, sort of slightly obscure paper of Isola and Politi, but they conjectured this uh, local holderness for real functions, for real quadratic polynomials, and this is what it is. So now the next object that I want to talk about is this so-called 
teapot or a thermostat. set. So, and the question is the following. So you look at these matrices that come from the Markov partition, and of course the entropy is the leading eigenvalue, but what about the other eigenvalues? And so this is a famous picture also that Thurston drew around the same time, probably seen. So this picture sometimes is called the Thurston set, sometimes it's called the bagel, sometimes it's called the entropy spectrum. So you can see this fascinating picture because it has a lot of complicated structure not on the inside and on the outside. And in fact, uh, I drew many pictures of this and variations thereof. And so what does this mean? What, what is this set? So this is the following. So we consider, for instance, all the real parameters for which the corresponding quadratic polynomial has a critical point, which is purely periodic. And in that case, we can uh, consider the, log the um, logarithm of the entropy. So, uh, sorry, we can consider this eigenvalue lambda, that's just e to the entropy. And this would be an algebraic number. So if this is an algebraic number, person was looking at the Galois conjugates of it. So what are the Galois conjugates? So if I have lambda as an algebraic number, this number has a minimum polynomial, so a min minimum degree polynomial with integer coefficients, such that lambda is its root. And then you have a finite set of complex numbers that are also root of the same polynomial. So this complex conjugates are somewhat really, you know, intertwined with lambda. There is no way to, to, to separate them in the algebraic sense. And so what he did is just consider the union of all such points. So there are finitely many such points for each lambda. And you take the union, of course, this is a countable set, and then you take the closure. So you get obviously an uncountable set. Questions about the definition? Okay, so this is the entropy spectrum. Yeah, there are various variations of this. You can draw it in black or in white. So one thing is that these are, are my renderings, which I, I hope are, are, are what Thurston intended to see are similar to his picture. So in fact, you have to, to, to draw this picture, you have to shade them appropriately because there are many, many more points in the other unit circle. So in fact, the, 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 the whiter this picture, means that there are more points in this uh, neighborhood, but you also have to uh, normalize it by taking the log of the density because the density of these points gets enormous near the unit circle. It's also interesting to notice that you have this uh, apparent alls here corresponding to the roots of unity. It turns out that the holes near the roots of unity are not uh, supposed to be there. They, they will eventually get filled in if you do more and more computations. But there are other holes that maybe you cannot quite see. They're a bit more irregular. Maybe, I don't know, here. So in some places, there are some, some holes that uh, you actually see. So yeah, in fact, this is uh, related to a paper of Caligari, Sarah Cook, and Holden Walker a couple of years ago, where they, they proved this in a similar set that there are some holes but not the obvious one. In fact, of course, uh, yeah, so this is uh, when you just see there's no shading, you just draw the set is in white. Also, it, it seems like there should uh, be an annulus contained in this set. And in fact, that's, that's what happened. Of course, uh, this uh, reminds people of other sets that have been studied a lot. See, for instance, from the type t uh, from the time of uh, Littlewood, the set of zeros of polynomials with coefficients plus or minus one. So you just have a polynomial, you have coefficients, uh, you can choose between plus and minus one. So you have countably many such polynomials, you take all the roots, and then you take the closure, you'll get some nice set. 
And in fact, this set has been studied by Gary Bush, among other people, and he proved that this set is connected and locally connected. Now, one thing which is different between this set and the previous one is this set is obviously symmetric when you take inversion with respect to the unit circle. So the outside part, the part outside the unit disk is the same under reflection of the part of the inside unit. And in fact, uh, you know, you could ask, well, are these similar? Right? They look pretty similar, at least on the inside. So yeah, so we call sigma plus or minus the set of zeros of polynomials with coefficients plus or minus one. So these are on the right hand side. And in fact, also similar pictures are for sets of zeros of polynomials with coefficients say zero and one. Except, uh, yeah, it's not quite the same set, but somewhat, somewhat looks similar. And this has been, for instance, studied by Blitz Component and actually many other people. And in fact, this is what I proved a few years ago that this set that this considered is indeed connected and locally connected. And also it contains a neighborhood of the unit circle. So there is some annulus and you can kind of estimate it. May estimate is probably not optimal, but you can at least give some estimate. Also kind of interesting about the set is closed undertaking nth root. So if I have a point, you think of it as a complex number and you have a complex, I don't know, square root or complex cube root of 10th root or for any n, all the roots are still in the set. And in fact, this uh, behavior is interestingly related to renormalization. So this is kind of very interesting actually, but maybe I won't have too much time to talk about this, but... And the other thing that I proved is that indeed the set, if you look at just the inside part, the part inside the unit disk, this set and the set considered by Littlewood and, and Barnsley and Bush and all these people, the ones with polynomials with just coefficients plus or minus one is indeed this. Okay, and th now the, the next object that Thurston considered, which is kind of closely related to this, it's what he calls the master keeper. So here's a picture. You see the teapot. So clearly you see the spout <laughs> of the teapot. And in fact, so here's a, from, in fact, the original paper of Thurston. So he says topological entropy of quadratic maps on a interval with periodic critical point. And I'll say first, and in fact, he asks the question, is the limiting three-dimensional set connected? Does the limiting set contain the unit cylinder? So in fact, we will address such questions. So there are several ways to produce a teapot-like object. And basically you can think of this teapot object as being a three-dimensional object that if you project down to the two-dimensional plane, you get back this bagel-like picture, this Thurston set. So one way to think about this is uh, to just look at 10 maps. Don't, don't bother with quadratic polynomials. Let's just do the 10 maps. So for each lambda, you have a 10th map. This is linear map of slope lambda. And again, you look at the parameters lambda for which the critical point, where critical point means this point, it's not, yeah, there's no derivative, but the, the monotonicity is changing, is purely periodic. And then again, you consider the Markov partition, and then you consider this matrix associated to it, and you take all the, eigenvalues. So here's the definition of Thurston's master teapot, at least for 10 maps. So this is the set of points Z and lambda. So, so lambda is basically the entropy. So it's the growth rate associated to this map and Z so all possible values of Z given lambda are all the eigenvalues. So clearly lambda itself is an eigenvalue because it's a leading eigenvalue. 
And so that, that's kind of one of the reasons why you have this tippet like structure. Because a point like this is a point of the form lambda lambda. So the height is, is the entropy. Yeah, so the entropy lambda is in this coordinate and Z in, is, in, in, is in, in the plane like that. Questions or curiosities about this? Okay, so wait. And in fact, you could also plot a similar picture with respect to the C coordinate. So this is this picture I plotted, which is similar, but slightly different. So you, you have the C coordinate here. So here you have quadratic, real quadratic polynomials, and this is the C parameter. So this is Z squared plus C. Again. And so for each C you plot in this slice, you plot this finite set of uh, eigenvalues whenever you, you have a, a point which is postcritically uh, periodic. And you see that already, again, you see something kind of similar to this Milner Thurston picture once again. So if you look to the right, you have the spout, and this spout now looks like the Milner Thurston picture. It's also interesting that. If you draw it like this, you see that you have a handle on the other side. So really it's a tipa. And the handle is related to this uh, renormalization, in fact. It's related to the period doubling phenomena and this fact that if you take a point, the nth root of it is also inside the tipa. And in fact, okay, this is another picture by my co-authors, Catherine Lindsay and, and Chen Shi Wu, where they, draw similar, uh, more or less the Thurston teapot. Uh, you can see more clearly another phenomenon here, and which is the following, that there are enormously more points towards the, the top of the teapot than towards the bottom. And in fact, uh, even Thurston and uh, observed at some in this uh, notes that this uh, object has the following monotonicity property, which is if I have a point, let's say I have a point Z lambda here in this object, then if I go above, so I pick another point with a bigger lambda, but the same Z. So I have lambda prime bigger than lambda, but the same Z. This is also in the people. So the steepot is getting larger and larger as you go up. And so this is called the persistence phenomenon. So the eigenvalues inside the unit disk do not depend continuously, actually. They depend continuously on the outside, we will see that, but in the inside, they have this persistence phenomenon. And in fact, so that's, uh, so one thing, I, this is what I proved, is that this master t put similarly to the Thurston set, in fact, that's how you prove that the Thurston set is connected. You first prove that this t put is connected and locally connected, and then you project down to two dimensions and it's still connected. And then Bray, Davis, Lenz, and Wu, they also proved this statement that inside the t put you have this, persistence phenomenon. So if you see a point at a certain height, you go up to a higher level, you still see the same point. And again, this I like to reconnect with the, the monotonicity of, of entropy. So, so, the Mandelbrot, so the dynamics of quadratic polynomial becomes more and more complicated. For instance, you have more and more periodic points as you go towards the tip of the Mandelbrot. And so, in fact, even in terms of these eigenvalues, you, you see this monotonicity property. As you go towards the tip, you see more and more eigen.
Okay, so in fact, uh, this is uh, sort of what, it, uh, what was known until recently. Now the most recent work that I want to address is what happens when you take a complex version of this teapot. So in fact, you can consider once again, for complex polynomials, you have this partition and you have a transition matrix for this Markov partition. And so you can consider the set of all eigenvalues of this matrix. So you consider the characteristic polynomial. And uh, yeah, clearly the growth rate, so e to the entropy is one such eigenvalue. And so you can ask, uh, well, what I asked before was whether the entropy depends continuously on with respect to the parameter. But now we can describe not just that, but whether all the other eigenvalues. So remember this example that we discussed. So we have this matrix and we have a characteristic polynomial. Now, before we were just looking at the dominant eigenvalue, but you could look at all the other eigenvalues. In this case, you have the degree four. So you have four points and you can plot them in the circle, uh, sorry, in the plane. So the circle is just for reference to see how many there are outside, how many inside, this is just not obvious. Okay, and in fact, we, cons we do obtain continuity results from the outside. And in fact, what we get is the following. So for every rational angle, we consider the set of zeros of this matrix associated to this Markov partition. And now the unfortunate thing is that in this general situation, we need to do separately what happens inside the disk and outside the disk. So the eigenvalues with modulus bigger than one behave in a certain way and the eigenvalues with modulus less than one behave in a different way. So the eigenvalues with modulus bigger than one move continuously. And so here's the theorem. So it's a generalization of what I proved a few years ago. It's basically, if you consider as a function of their complex uh, parameter and also as a function of the external angle, so Q over Z is a space of rational angles. So as you go around the Mandelberg set, you look at the zeros of this uh, characteristic polynomial and as a, as a map which maps into compact subsets of the plane, this is continuous. So from here, in fact, uh, we could get a, a teapot, uh, teapot and bagels <laughs> like in the real case. So in particular, we look at what's called a vein. So what is a vein? So again, I, I read a mention before, a vein would be an arc from the center of the Mandelbrot set to, to some tip, for instance. And this is uh, the existence of such veins was proven by Brunner and Duadi, and that's a delicate theorem, but we're mostly interested in the combinatorial picture. And in particular, we're interested in what are called uh, principal veins. So principal veins are a particular, a particular structure so for each P over Q, so let's say for instance, P over Q is one third. That's the classical uh, principal vein in the one third limb. So, so how do we define it? Well, basically we, we single out a particular parameter that has a particular dynamics, which is like this. So if the tree is, so if the critical, uh, sorry, if P over Q is one over three, we want a parameter whose dynamics is similar to what we described before, a bit prefixed. So the critical point after three iterations maps to a fixed point. You see maps to here, here, and then to fixed point. In this case, this corresponds to to the theta angle one, one four. And the, so the Hubbard tree is a star, is, is a, 
as q q prongs in this case three prongs and the rotation around the fixed point is one third so so the fixed point is here so this is a particular parameter that we can associate for each p over q and so that's precise in fact in the, in the previous case if you do one third it's, it's precisely c one third is precisely at this point and so the principal vein in this case the one third principal vein is precisely this one that i drew and then there are other points so c one half is just the tip of the regular method or so and then c one quarter is somewhere maybe here And I don't see one fifth is here, see two fifths is here, something. Like so these are the so called principal veins. So it's the simplest in the combinatorial sense. Okay. And for each of them, we can construct a teapot and we can construct a bagel. So, in fact, exactly that, that's the definition. So the principal vein. P of a Q principal vein is the vein joining the origin with this point CPQ. So this is would be zero, this would be C one third. And theta is the set of angles that land that lands on the vein. So for instance, these angles are all elements of theta one third. And so now we can define a Thurston set for the principal vein. And that's corresponding, it's, it's pretty similar, is you take for each critically periodic parameter along the vein, you take the eigenvalues, the Z is an eigenvalue of this matrix. So M theta is the matrix associated to a parameter in the vein. So for instance, this would be one picture like that for the, I think one third limb. In fact, a few years ago, I, I had drawn such pictures. So this would be for the one third vein. This would be for the one fifth vein. This would be for the one eleventh vein. It kind of gets thinner, but still they look kind of uh, in a similar way. And in fact, we could prove using the previous result that if you use, if you take the set and you look at the part outside the disk, then this is path connected. That's a con it's a equivalent uh, result to what originally was was proven for the real. So all the but unfortunately we have only good understanding on the outside. So the inside in the real case was proven to be connected and locally connected and everything by showing that it's the same as this other set that lots of people considered before but in this case it's much harder to characterize so it's it's not quite as satisfying and then there's also teapot like this so you could guess at this point where the teapot is so the teapot is a similar thing so we take first of all for each lambda I consider well what I consider all parameters along the vein that have lambda as growth rate. And then I take the determinant. So you take the characteristic polynomial, so you get again the eigenvalues of the matrix. Yeah, so there's a little bit of an issue here whether we take the union or the intersection. So yeah, because given lambda there would be different values of theta which give you the same lambda so in fact then the the best way is to take the intersection of, of all such finite sets because in fact that this would be the smallest possible and so that that is indeed that is indeed the same as the, yeah the, the natural generalization of this teapot to this uh, p over q plane. 
And the question is, uh, I realize it's a little hard to parse this definition. So maybe if you have questions, it's, it's good time to ask. Okay, so the upshot is indeed that we have the same persistence result. So for this uh, complex tipa, so we also have the same thing that if you see a point at a certain height in the inside of the tipa, so in the part inside the unit cylinder, then if you go up, you see the same. So if you have a point somewhere at certain height, you go up, you still the same sense of point. So this steeple is kind of growing as you go towards the top. Depending on how you actually plot it, you could see more or less this, this behavior. Yeah, in fact, for fun, you can, you can see on my website, I put a lot of, of uh, somehow simulations of this type, so maybe I can show you those in a second. So this is a rotating rendering of the master teapot. It's a, okay, the rotating part is just for fun. You can also see. Questions or curiosities about it? Okay, let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so I guess I still have 10 minutes, I guess. Yeah, okay, good. So yeah, so, so in the last 10 minutes, I wanna give you an idea what, what the type of techniques are used because sometimes I think that, yeah, they're kind of interesting in, in, in its own. So, so one thing is how, how do we actually compute this answer? So basically the way you compute this entropy in the, as we said before, would be to write this matrix and then you take the leading eigen. But this problem, this uh, idea has, has problems because first of all, you have to know what the tree looks like. So if I give you an angle theta, the question is, can you really tell how uh, this uh, tree looks like? Maybe you can, but it might be, slightly complicated to tell. And also it varies a lot. When I change the parameter even a little bit, the question, this is not very stable at all. But in fact, Thurston suggested a different way to do this. And the way was to look at pairs of those critical points. So what does that mean? Well, instead of looking at uh, the partition and the usual partition, you look at all the possible arcs between those critical points. So the idea is kind of, it seems, seems kind of stupid, but it turns out to be quite useful, of course. So you have maybe your tree and your tree has maybe four mark points. So this, this would be the most critical orbit, one, two, three, four. And then you take all possible arcs. So for instance, you take the arc between one and two then you take the arc between one and three. Then you take the arc between two and three. Then you take the arc between one and four. Then you take the arc between two and four and between three and four. 
So it seems like a redundant thing to do. You, you, you have four points, you have six arcs. That's a lot of them. The matrix becomes really enormous. But this way of keeping track of the dynamics is going to be much more stable, much better in to compute. And in fact, because there's only one thing that you have to know to compute the transition matrix if you do it this way. So the idea is this, there's two cases. Either a pair is non-separated, meaning that between two points, you look at this arc, and this arc does not contain the critical point. And if this points are label one and two, like this one, one and two, well, the map here, there's no critical point in the middle, so it's just a homeomorphism. So the, this would naturally map to two, three. That's by the way we label. We just add one to both ends because there's no folding. Then there's the other case, but it's the only other case, which is if you have two points which lie on opposite side of the critical point, then there is folding. So the image, you see the image of such arc has two sub pieces. So it goes from here to here and from here back. And so you write this piece as the union of two pieces. So you have this one, two, three. You write it as one, zero, union, uh, zero, three because there's this folding in the middle. So you have to keep track of both of them. And so, and then you just add to one to both of them. So you get one zero goes to one two and zero three goes to one four. So there's two types of transitions and that's it. So if, so you can write this matrix, which is still finite at this level and the uh, entries are given by these pairs. So there's a, a quadratic number of them in the, in the number in the period, but still. So if ij is not separated, it maps to ij i plus one, j plus one. And if it's separated, it maps to i plus one, one, and one, j plus one. So those are the only two options. And in fact, it was verified by, by Tanle and collaborators that you do get the same eigenvalue, even though the entropy is usually computed with this other matrix. The two, the two matrices give you the same leading eigenvalue. And in fact, later we have to prove that even for the other eigenvalues, the, non, the important eigenvalues are still the same, even though the matrix is bigger. But what's really nice about this is this, this is a much more stable. And the reason why it's much more stable it's because everything moves continuously. If you move, so you should have this one, two, three, four. So if I consider another parameter, which is nearby, well, this one moves to some, I don't know, one prime would be like this, and three maybe would be three prime. And four would move a little bit, but, but you see if this, critical point is in the middle, meaning that you can, you can cut the Julia set in two, in two parts and, and this uh, arc is split in two parts. When you, when you move this arc a little bit, it's still split in the same way. So this is a super much more robust way to compute this entropy because these conditions are, are, are stable. Instead of the previous one is not stable. That's the most important technical issue. Now there's another issue, which is I, I find really, really nice. And so maybe I can take a couple of minutes to discuss that briefly, is that we can compute the, the polynomial, the, the characteristic polynomial of a matrix by, by doing the following trick. So yeah, start with a matrix. And then I consider the characteristic polynomial, or in fact, the spectral determinant, which is the reciprocal of the characteristic polynomial. 
And then the entropy, of course, is the root of that. What is kind of neat is that you can express a characteristic polynomial of a matrix. This just for finite matrix is the following way. So I think of a graph associated to the adjacency matrix. And I can write a sum over all so-called simple multicycles in this graph. And so basically, what is a simple multicycle? Is a disjoint union of simple cycles. And these cycles are disjoint in a strong sense that the vertex disjoint. And then we take C, the number of connected components. So let me conclude with the following exercise for the audience. Even if you don't know and you, you are bored of complex dynamics, this is, uh, this is basically linear algebra. So we can re rewrite this characteristic polynomial in the following way. So L is the length of the cycle and C is the number of connected components. So, so it's just, I give you this graph. So let's try to compute P of T. So there's always the empty cycle, which gives you one. So that's it. So are there any cycles of period one? So the graph is this one on the left. No, there's nothing of period one. Is there something of period two? Yeah, there are two cycles of period two. One and two, right? And so we put T squared, this is period two. We have two of them. And the sign is negative because these are connected. They have, only have one component. So how about period three? Yeah, we have one of period three. So, and this is also connected, so we have to put one. How about period four? So you could think that there is two plus two. Yeah, but, there, but this doesn't count because they're not really disjoint. And how about period five? So it turns out there is one thing you can do with period five because you have you can have multi cycles. So meaning you can have a unions. So you have a period two and period three. So two plus three is five, and that would count as period five. But then the sign would be plus because you have two components. This is this has two components, so the sign is minus one to the number of components. Okay, so this is an exercise in linear algebra. I, 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 find, I find it very, very interesting because this is a very nice way to capture the, the, the combinatorics of this graph in a simpler way. And in fact, eventually what I, real, what I did at some point is to generalize this. So let me just very briefly go through this. So to generalize this, so countably, to graphs with countably many vertices. So if you have a countable graph, you can take the, find the growth rate as the number of closed paths of certain lengths. So you have the number of closed paths of certain length, and you take the nth root, and this gives you some number. And this number is related to the entropy eventually. 
And so basically the idea is that you can compute a, sim, a power, so if you have a countable graph with certain properties, you can compute this characteristic polynomial. But in this case, instead of a polynomial, you get a power series. And you have to prove that this power series indeed converges. And the, the key point is that even though the number of cycles itself grows pretty fast, the number of simple cycles or multi-cycles grows slowly. It's less than exponential. And so this gives you a classic, uh, so, somewhat variation of the classical Milner-Thurston, in a sense, approach, which is you compute the entropy using a power series. And in this case, we compute the entropy using this, this power series. And this power series is holomorphic in the unit disk. And the, the minimum, the root of minimum modulus is the entropy, basically. And so the idea is similar. And then, of course, you have to construct this graph. So, you know, there's, there's some more combinatoric, so we'll not really go too much into this. So basically, the main idea of this continuity argument is that for each, if you have a sequence of angles, you construct a sequence of graphs, of countable graphs, and I call this graphs wedges for certain reasons. And then from here, we construct this uh, power series for each parameter, there's a different power series. But the way this power series is constructed, because it's uh, derived from this uh, being separated or non-separated of the various elements of the post-critical orbit, they have certain continuity properties. So the, the coefficients converge to each other. So then if the coefficients converge to each other, and there is some uh, boundedness in the coefficients, they're not bounded, but somehow they're controlled. Then also the roots of this uh, holomorphic functions, the root by Risha's theorem will converge to each other. And so that's where this continuity type of property comes from. And this was the original idea, but then if you do the other eigenvalues, well, also you still have continuity for the other eigenvalues. Okay, so this I think is a, bit of a sketch. So there are many other questions which I don't have time to discuss, so I will skip it for the moment. So I'll just leave you with a picture of the score entropy for cubics, which is also very interesting. So you have two dimensions, so you have a surface in that case. In any case, thanks for your attention so far. So let me know if you have any questions. So thank you very much to the Professor Julio for the presentation. So any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I I got an equation. Este, yeah. um, um, I I want to know if uh, there is uh, a possibility of uh, generalize these results for. Uh, degree three or, or, or greater uh, because I see this is just for uh, the degree two case, but I, I don't know if, if, if it can be generalized. Well, yeah, in fact, um, some, yeah, yeah. In fact, we did already some, some of it, yeah. So, so this, uh, the, there's uh, this other, work with, with Gao Yan, where we, we do, in fact, prove the continuity result for, for cubics and high, for any, for any degrees. Yeah. It's interesting already in that case that the parameter space, so in this case, the combinatorial parameter space is just a circle, basically. But in that case, you have a higher dimensional parameter space and even the combinatorics and the topology of it is, is not, not so easy. For instance, in, in, even in degree three, the, the, the parameter space is, is, is like a Möbius band. So there is some non-trivial topology even just to define it. So, uh, um, and, and what if, uh, if, if, for example, uh, uh, I restrict to uh, the degree three map uh, with a fixed critical point? And, and mm -hmm. one free 
three critical points. So uh, in this case, uh, the parameter space is just C. Uh, yeah. What, what, what in that case? Yeah, of course, the continuity, if it's proven in more general, more general case, it's also true. But yeah, but yeah, I agree. I mean, it is interesting. Yeah, I, we haven't spent too much time. There is more to be said. Yeah, for instance, you could ask, if you have a one-dimensional slice, you can ask where's the minimum, where's the maximum of the entropy, um, how many maxima there are, and things like this. Though so this is a very interesting question, actually, which I think is promising. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, no problem. Well, so thanks again to the Professor Giulio for, for the talk. Now we have a break. We return for the next talk at 17 hours. Thanks a lot. Yes. You guys have a Oscar. Oh, I see some non non grad students in, this, in the audience. <laughs> nice. Okay. This is also on YouTube. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Thanks very much to everybody. Yes. You guys enjoy. Unfortunately, here it's very cold. It's
plus 2AQ plus B. And now, uh, why this equation? Well, because this, this equation gives very explicit information about things that are important. For example, as you could read here, I'm saying that A, the A that appears in the equation of the polynomial is the mark critical point. You will understand in a little bit what I mean by mark. Then, um, so if I take the image of, of this A under B, I, under A, I get a number B that appears here, which is a mark critical value. And then minus A is what we will call the free critical point because a, quadra, a cubic map has two critical points. So one is A and the other one is minus A. And uh, 2A is, uh, is a point that is important in the study of cubic polynomials because it has the nice property that the image of 2A is the same as the image of minus A. And then minus 2A is called the Marco critical point. And this has a similar property just that the image of the point minus 2A, which is the same as the image of the point A, which is the Marco critical uh, point. That's why this minus 2A is called Marco critical point. And the other one is called free co critical point. Okay, so these are important uh, notations for this. And we want to study the polynomial. So you notice in my polynomial, I have two parameters, right? That I have Zs or Zs, and I have two letters which are A and B. So this A and B are the parameters, and we're going to consider the set of all those maps um, that I, or, or all those points A comma B in C2, because I go, we're gonna let A to be a complex number and B to be a complex number. And we're going to vary these points over the whole um, C2 plane, uh, complex plane. And then to each one of these A and B, we are associating a map F. That's why here it says F A comma D. But just for, uh, for um, A, to not to be writing the whole thing on the time, we just call it F. But this F, capital F, is always going to uh, have associated some A and B in the parameter space. Okay, so since this is a, a family of cubic maps, of cubic polynomials, so Milner uh, suggested that the best way to study, because as I said, this A and B are any complex numbers, so the, the best way to study such a big parameter space will be to divide it in slices. So in these slices, you have to choose them in an intelligent way. And the intelligent way was to uh, consider the period P curves. And this is what we're going to call SP. And this is going to consist of all maps or, of all parameters A and B such that a mark critical point A has period exactly P. So the mark critical point is periodic of period P. Okay, so Milner proof that this SP, this, this, uh, this slices for all P are smooth affine curves in C2. And this was around 1993 when he proved this result. And then it was open for a long time, and the fact that the curve base P is connected for every period P. So this is a very difficult theorem that was just proved by Matthew Arfo and Jan Kiwi. And I think Jan is gonna talk about this on Thursday at 4 p.m. Okay, so why is this so hard to study? Why is SP so hard to study? Well, because now that, that they prove that this SP is connected, we can call it a Riemann surface. And then we will see that the genus of this curve SP, it grows very fast when we change 
the, the value of P. It is a table. So notice, for example, if you take period one, that the genus is zero, okay, nice. If you take period two, the genus is zero. If you take period three, then you have a torus because the genus is one. But look over here. If you take period six, then the genus is already 393. So it's very big and it grows very fast, even for the smaller values of P. Now, associated to these, um, to these periods, there are also some punctures. And these punctures also grow very fast. Look at these numbers. So it says when you have period one, you have one puncture. When you have period two, you have two punctures. When you have period three, you have eight punctures. But when you have period uh, six, you have 144 punctures. So these are a lot of punctures for a period six. Okay, now, okay. Associated to these punctures, there is some region which is called the escape region in SP. This is going to be a component, a connected component of the curve that consists of all those maps, of all those parameters A and B, for which the, the point minus A escapes under iteration, okay? Escapes to infinity under iteration. So, this is the free critical point. So you iterate, and, and when you iterate this minus A, is go, if you are in the escape region, is going to escape to infinity, the orbit of that critical point minus A. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between escape regions and puncture points. Now, I'm going to define what is a parameter ray. Um, so, uh, if I have a map F or a, you know, a, a, a two pair A comma V, this, this a map is going to belong to a parameter ray with some co-critical angle that I'm going to call uh, T if the dynamic ray of angle theta passes to the co-critical point to A. So here is a picture. So if you take a map in the escape region, you're always going to see, um, well, that the Julia set is not going to be connected, and um, that this is the kind of picture of equipotential that occurs in the escape regions because you're going to have a figure eight curve that goes between this uh, point, the, the free co critical point to A, and the critical point. Uh, the free critical point minus A. Inside, you get the, the Julia set, two, two pieces separated by this hole here, okay? But then if there is a ray, you have a ray landing at, at this point or going through, no landing, but going through the critical point to A. So this is the one that we're going to call a parameter ray. And it has the property that when you subtract either minus one third or when you add one uh, to, a, to it plus one third, this, the, one of these guys is periodic of some period P. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is the same definition that I gave before. So I said that the, the point will be coperiodic or coperiod Q if either theta plus one third or theta minus one third is periodic or period Q under tripling mode uh, integers. So as you see, there are, okay, so this curve has also the property that the escape regions, um, you know, they are not necessarily different. They are multiplicity mu greater than zero. So far, in, uh, you know, in the examples that we have studied, which is S1, S2, and S3, the multiplicity of all the escape regions is one. So the first time that we met um, an escape region with multiplicity two is when we studied uh, S4. It's the first number when you have two regions that have multiplicity two. 
Okay, so each, each puncture in the Riemann surface is surrounded by an escape region, which is going to be diffeomorphic to the complex plane minus the disk. And the connected locus of this curve is, uh, well, is a set, is a compact connected set, but it's also the, the place where the two critical points, the free and the mark one, are periodic or period P, and the Julia set is connected. And the complement of the curve minus this uh, connected locus is a disjoint union of open sets, which are the escape regions. Okay, so I think I'm gonna show you some pictures. Uh, let me go to my program. Now, I think I have to share what you were seeing before. So let me change this business and let me send you here. Now I want to share this. Okay, so now you see pictures, right? Yeah? Answer me, please. Yes. yes. Okay. So this this guy, the first the this guy, the first guy that I'm moving the mouse on top of, is S one. All right. So what is the escape region? Is this uh, pink region outside? And there is an I an a puncture point that you don't see that is at infinity. So if you could put this into a sphere. Um, you will see that if you fold it, everything, uh, you know, pink closes in the North Pole. And what you see in orange here is the, the um, connected locus. And this curve is called um, S1 because if you pick a point here, let me just pick a point there. Come on, computer. Nice. Um, I'm going to spawn a Julia set here. So if you if you click in one place, say there, in a copy of the Mandel root set, you're going to get um, a Julia set that is connected. And this is not very good because it's vertical. But if I could trace, um, well, first of all, I could mark A. This is A, this white point. I don't know if you see it, but I hope you do. So if I if I trace this point and I want to see what is its orbit, nothing is gonna happen. Um, I need to move this. Hope the internet is behaving. So if I see this. Oh. If I trace this, you see it doesn't go anywhere because it's a fixed point, right? So the points, I don't know, you see a little blue line that is trying to approach this point um, A. You see? Maybe I go a little fast, farther and you can see that the line is going to the fixed point. This is an attractive point. Now you want to look at something outside. Let me go something outside. So you see how it looks in the escape region. If I draw a map over here. You see, there are, uh, there are two pieces, right? There are two pieces of the Julia set. And someplace in this gap is the, the point minus a, let me draw it, let's see if I can draw it. There you go. So, and then, you know, over here will be the, the rays scratching together, theta minus one third and theta plus one third. And then, um, well, yeah, and then I can study the dynamics. So one part, so in the, in the escape region that Julia said is not connected. Okay, so this is S1. So let's finish with S1. Now this guy over here is S2. Come on. This is S2. I don't think you can see the whole thing, right? Yes. All right. I do. 
it's um it doesn't fit in my screen, I guess. This is S2, but anyway, you can see here more or less that there is um, there are two escape regions, so there are two punctures, one inside this area, which we call um, the circle region, and there is one outside here, and this is the basilica region. So if I click anywhere over there, I'm going to get little basilicas. And over here, the Julia set uh, of the map in anything that is yellow or orange is going to be connected, but outside it is connected. Now, let me show you S3, unless you want to see little basilicas. Um, this is the torus. Well, when it wants to come up. Come on. Oh, sorry. I think I'm not clicking on it here. Yeah. This is this is the universal cover of the torus. So you see that here, well, this is the universal co to, uh, cover. So there are many regions, but you can see that there are uh, some of them are repeated. So this is, for example, the rabbit region. This is the core rabbit region. Over here, you have the airplane region, and then you have um, this is some region that we call, um, uh, I think we call it 100, 100 plus, 100 minus, 0, 10 plus, 0, 10 minus, and this is another region that we call 0, 10. So we're gonna talk about more about this more later, but you can see that there are eight punctures, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one here, because this is a torus. There are eight punctures, and there are eight escape regions. Okay. I'm gonna go back to my talk now. Let's see. I go to Zoom, and I want to share my talk. All right. Okay, so I hope that um, helped you a little bit to know what I'm talking about. And so for if I take a polynomial, as I said, in the connected net locus, then I'm going to have a, a diagram like this, where I'm saying that the complement of the field Julia set of the map is conformal isomorphic as the complement of the closed disk. And I can, uh, have this um, commutative diagram uh, between. So here is my map F, and over here I have the map that sends uh, W to W cube. Why do I care about this? I care about this. I hope you see in the talk because I want to define external uh, dynamical rays. So this is my Julia set. And if I want to define the, the, the external dynamical rays like this, I have to go back to the complement, here is the disk, to the complement of the disk. And then I can take some angles in, the, in C minus D, for example, the angle of you know, 1A, 2A, 3A, 5A, 6A, blah, blah. And then by this conformal isomorphism, I go back to, the, to my to the complement of my field Julia set, and I define my external dynamical rays. This will be my 1A ray, 2A ray, 3A ray, 4A, 5A, and 6A, okay? Now, there is another property um, that we can see. I'm gonna just put a picture. So we're going to define, since these rays land together, we can all, also represent the angles in a circle, right? And we can say that, okay, so which rays are landing together? For example, here I can say that in my Julia set, the ray 1 8 and 3 8 land together. So I draw a, an arc between 1 8 and 3 8. And then I also notice that the ray 2 6 and, sorry, three eights and six eights land together, so here we go. So that means that in this case, the four rays land together, and so they are in the same equivalence class, right? 
but we have that the fact here that every like pair of angles is periodic or period two, for example, one eight, and the tripling gets mapped to three eights. If you multiply this by three again, you get mapped to back to one eight. One fourth gets mapped to three fourths, and you get back to one fourth. Five eighths get mapped to seven eighths, and you go back to, to five eighths. So this is a representation of the dynamics of the race, right? Of how the race behaves in the Julia set and we do it with a circle. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to talk about the landing theorem. So for every parameter ray, we some rational parameter angle theta. We say that it lands a uh, some map F, which belong to the boundary of its escape region in S3. Well, I wanted to go back to the picture, but um, but no. So, for example, if I if I have an angle which is coperiodic or coperiod Q, so this is going to be the landing uh, map. This landing map has a parabolic orbital period or ray right period Q. Okay, so let me explain this. So, the, in this case, this picture is the landing map of the ray five six. How do I know? Because look here, this is the co-critical point, free co-critical point, and I have a co-critical angle which is para, which is um, landing at a component that contains this this point two eight. Now, if I look at theta minus uh, five six minus one third or five six plus one third, I obtain one half. Seven, yeah. If you add two to six, then you obtain one half. And then you see that this ray is a ray which is fixed, right? Because if you multiply by three, you get mapped to three halves and it's, it's just fixed. So this is uh, what I'm talking about when I said this landing map has a parabolic orbit of ray period Q. In this case, this is the parabolic point where the ray is landing theta plus two thirds, I think, and is landing at this parabolic point and this has ray period one, so it's fixed. And what I said before is this, that the critical point lands at a component that contains uh, two A. Okay, so this is one possibility. What is the other possibility? The other possibility is that if you have a rational angle, but no coperiodic, then we say that the map is critically finite. And here is a picture. So this is an example. In this case, the ray, this is the picture of the landing ray, which is one over nine. And when you go to one over nine, then uh, this is your coperiodic angle. And if you take uh, one nine minus one third, one nine plus one third, then you obtain um, you obtain the rays that are crashing at a point minus a. I don't know if you can see, but here is a point minus a, right? And then this is um, the dynamic rays lands at a critical point two a, and the forward orbit of two a or the minus a is eventually periodic repelling. So you follow the orbit of this rays is eventually periodic repelling. So these are the pictures of the landing mass of one nine and the other one was five, six. These, these guys are in S2. Oh, sorry. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the period field tessellation of SP. So what is this? So, well, we have parameter rays and we want to look at parameter rays of certain period. This is the period Q. And so the period Q tessellation is gonna consist of all parameter rates of the period Q in all escape regions together with their landing points. And this is going to decompose, decompose, um, decompose SP into a finite number of connected open sets that we're going to call phases of the tessellation. I will show a picture soon. But I also want to 
first tell you that the edges of the tessellation will be those parameter rays of period Q. And the vertices, we have two kinds of vertices. They could be parabolic vertices if they are the landing point of the rays, or ideal vertices if they are the punctured points. They are the center or the scale views. And every edge, every ray is going to join a parabolic vertex to an ideal vertex. Okay, and we conjecture, we don't have a proof, we conjecture that all phases of the tessellation are simply connected if and only if either P is equals to Q or P is equals to one. I will show you. Okay. Uh, yeah, for example, here, I want to look at this. This is S2, this is a picture of S2, and we have the period two tessellation. You see, uh, case Q is two and P is two. So S, I am on the curve S2, and I'm considering the period two tessellation. So I have the rays, I have two rays landing at the point, at one parabolic point here, this is the ray 17 over 24 and 19 over 24. This is one phase. And I have a symmetric phase on the bottom, bounded by the edges 524 and 724. Okay. Now look, this is a zooming of the center. So you see here that I have more faces, right? And inside and outside. And I have how many faces? Um, well, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. There is a little face here, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. But I also have, um, well, this is another face. This is 13. Uh, this is another face, 14. This is another phase 15, and this is another phase 16. So there are 16 phases, if I didn't forget these two, in, the, um, in this, in this uh, tessellation of S2. So here is a picture. I can see the phases better here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, okay? And now what I want to say is that, um, and we have the corresponding orbit portraits on those faces. Let me see, did I say, um, I don't wanna go ahead, uh, uh, I don't want to go ahead of myself. Can I go back? Yeah, so, Okay, so I just said that, yeah, so I'll just talk about phases. Okay, good. So now I'm going to talk about the orbit portraits. And for the orbit portraits, the idea is that this is called persistence of orbit portraits. So if you have a, a map in a phase and you have an angle, rational angle of period Q under the tripling dynamic, uh, dynamic ray, so what we have is that for all two maps in the same phase of the tessellation, always, always have the same orbit portrait, okay? The same well-defined orbit portrait. It also says that we have a correspondence between the, the maps and the landing points, and that this correspondence is holomorphic. Uh -huh. And then we also want you to observe that if we have faces with an edge in common, they always seem to have different orbit portraits. I think this is it for this page. Okay, so let me show you before I go to that. Let me go back to here. So in each phase, so what I'm saying here is that the orbit portrait, for example, in this phase between 22 over 24 and 23 over 24, this orbit portrait is gonna hold in the whole phase. And similarly, this orbit portrait that is uh, in this phase, you have a phase that is bounded by several rays, 22 over 24, these two, 14 over 24, and these two. 
this or the portrait is going to hold along that face. You have a different or the portrait if you go between 24, uh, 1724 and 1924. And the same thing happens inside. Now, if you look, this is an edge, right? So if you look at the orbit portrait inside 22, 24, and 23, 24, and if you look outside, you can see that the orbit portraits are different. So these two faces are separated by the edge 23 over 24, and they have different orbit portraits. If you look at the orbit inside, if you look at the face inside, and now compared with array 22 over 24 outside, and you see that again, that two uh, orbit portraits are different. So even if they share a face, things like when you share a, a sorry, an edge, then your orbit portrait changes. Okay, that's the first observation. Okay, good. We talk about this. Now I'm showing you here the two tessellation of the of um, of the torus. And this red region here is marking the fundamental domain. Okay, so this is just having exactly one copy of every escape region. So that's why there are eight of them. And you can see all the all the rays of period two. Each escape region, if you see, has the same uh, rays. If you look, it's 23, 22, 17, 14, 13, uh, 10, 7, 5, and 2 and six, and all of them have the same ones. They appear in all escape regions. This region, according to our conjecture, you can see that this region is not simply connected because if you look here, this rabbit part is separated from the other one, right? For on these spaces, you can construct a circle here around this, this rabbit region and you don't intersect any of the edges of the other of the tessellation. Okay. When when we have uh, okay so but I think I have to say something else here. Yeah. So this is just the tessellation two of a street lifted to the universal uh, covering space of the torus. If I if I had show you that the third the three tessellation then things will be different because then I will be drawing rays that go from these components around the rabbit. And they're gonna make the tessellation to be uh, simply connected. Okay, next. Uh, okay, so here, let me go back again. So now I'm going to be in this little part. So this is the airplane region. This is another rabbit region. I think it's the co co rabbit, but this is the rabbit. And I'm going to be uh, zooming in in this region, in this uh, upper, what is this, right corner of the airplane and these regions. So let me show you. So the top one is the zero 10 region. Here is the rabbit. Here is the airplane. And here is the 100 minus region. And this is assuming uh, these are the orbit portraits for the period two tessellation. So you can see right here, we have a face. So that face is given by the face is very big here. It's uh, this, 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 just take out those, right? This face has a lot of edges in the boundary. And look at his orbit portrait. Its orbit portrait is just consists of two rays landing together, five and seven. Now, if you go this this space that I see inside, that contains part of the airplane region. If I want to look at the edge on the left, then you can see that the orbit portrait outside is empty. Right? There are no rays of period two landing together there. So you have two faces that are separated by one edge and they have different orbit portraits. All right, so over here, you can consider this a little face. And if you see here, the orbit portrait is also different from the one in the big face here. Okay, 
So this, are, this is what is happening um, with the with desolation of the, of the obesity in this little region. Okay, so now uh, what else do I want to talk about? Well, I want to talk about some property that we call upper semi-continuity. And this says that, okay, so now if you have a um, parabolic, well, if you have a map and the orbit portrait of a map, this orbit portrait is gonna be contained in the orbit portrait of the parabolic point uh, F0 for all F in that uh, neighborhood U. So here is another uh, view, as you can see, I like the airplane. So this is a cartoon of the orbit portraits uh, in the same region in the upper right corner of the airplane. And you can see here that if I take any map in this, in this wake that I, I'm sorry, I don't call it a wake. In this, in this area, in this uh, region that is determined or in this space that is determined by the rays 67 and 68. So I have a parabolic point here. So every point in here is going to have exactly the same orbit portrait as the one that I drew here. And this happens for every single uh, little face that I draw in my picture. So this is what the upper continuity property says. Okay, so now I can say the word wake, and I'm going to say that a wake in SP is a simply connected open subset which satisfies the following conditions. Okay, so the wake is gonna be bounded by two parameter rates of the same co-period, which lie, this is very important, in the same escape region and land at a common parabolic point in the boundary of the escape region. And each wave contains a hyperbolic component of type D, which has the common landing point on its boundary. And the orbit portrait for points in this root hyperbolic component is non-trivial and is contained in the orbit portrait for any point of the wave. This is what we kind of saw before. And this wave, does not intersect any escape region other than the one where we are, okay? So this way is when you go through two escape regions, you call that thing a phase. When you limit yourself to a way or to a region determined by, okay, so I'm gonna go up there. When you go, when you limit yourself, um, I don't know if I this. Well, yeah, if I limit myself over here to the region determined by the angles 67 and 68, then this is a this is the wake. And for example, this guy is not the the, um, the region determined by the ray 68, 50, 53, 55, uh, 56, 61, 62, 64. 67 and 49, this is not a weight because this goes through two different escape regions. I have one escape region here, airplane, and over here is 0, 10, minus. Okay. okay, so this is a phase, this is a weight. This little inside here is also a weight, okay? All right, now let's talk about the weight conjecture. Oh, I have more pictures here. Any two rays in the same escape region with a common parabolic landing point bound a unique uh, determined way. So you can see here, again, as I said, I have a fixation with a airplane region. You can see uh, all the little wakes that I drew, um, right? They are in black. And the faces are these regions that go that, that go through two or more uh, escape regions because here you have airplane, here you have zero 10, and here you have um, one, uh, one 10. So you have three different escape regions and this phase goes all over. You also have here a little phase in this case. Uh, well, yeah, 
that goes between uh, 110 and the airplane, etc. So there are many, many pictures here of weights and uh, faces. Okay. But something important to notice is that, um, well, that we claim the following. So McMullen showed that quasi-conformal copies of the Mandelbrot set appear in all parameter families of rational maps. And our map is not, our family is not an exception. So you saw many pictures of, of um, Mandelbrot sets in our, in our, in our curves SP. So we conjecture that every parabolic point in SP is contained in a unique complete copy M of SP or the Mandelbrot set. And then, of course, P is going to be the root point of a unique hyperbolic component that we're going to call HM. And this type component is of type D, meaning it has two, uh, two uh, different attracting orbits. And over oh, here, we disjoin attracting orbits of period P and Q, where Q is the right period of the point P. So is the period of the parabolic ray landing at the point, at the parabolic point. So in this case, P, the, the orbit portrait of the point at P and at any other map in the hyperbolic component have the same orbit portrait. So if we assume both the Mandelbrot copy conjecture and the weight conjecture, then we have that every boundary point of an escape region is going to be the landing point of at most two parameter rays from this region, okay? So assuming both the Mandelbrot copy conjecture and the weight conjecture, then we have that every boundary point of an escape region is going to be the landing point of at most to parameter rays from this region, meaning from the same escape region, because there are places where we see three parameter rays or four parameter rays landing together. Okay, so now we're going to define what is primary, what we call primary and secondary rays. So if two, or more parameter rays of a period Q land at the point P, then the two of these rays which are closest to HP are gonna be called the primary rays. And or primary edges of the tessellation. And they gonna, they going to play in a special role because they uh, form part of all the boundary for the phase of that tessellation, which contains that hyperbolic component H. Okay, so if there are any other rays, as I said, sometimes there are three rays or there are four rays, then these rays are going to be called secondary rays or secondary edges if I'm talking about that tessellation. And the way conjecture, because we said that the two rays have to be in the same escape region, the way conjecture is going to imply that a secondary rate must be in a different escape region. Exactly, and we're gonna call primary weights those which are bounded by primary rays and secondary weights those which are bounded by, secondary weights those which are bounded by secondary rays. All right. So if I go back, uh, let me see, do I have a picture or not yet? So I guess what I showed you before, oops. So I guess what I show you here is you see these two, this, uh, what is this, 49 and 50 are primary rays and this ray right here, 68, is a secondary ray. So here I have three rays landing together Two of them belong to the same escape region and the other one belongs to a different one. Yeah, and if you look at, there are places where you only have two rays landing together and this will be a primary wake, right? And also this will be a primary wake because these two rays land together in the same escape region. Okay, so in here, I don't have any example of four rays landing together. Okay, 
but it will come later, don't worry. Okay, so we saw this, we talk about this. Now we're gonna talk about the monotonicity and non-monotonicity conjectures. Okay, so this says, okay, so as we cross any primary ray of a period Q, the period Q orbit portrayed always changes. And this change is always monotonic. I'm going to explain this if it's not clear in the sense that the new orbit portrait either contains or is contained in the old one, okay? This is the monotonicity conjecture. So if the ray lands at the root point P of a hyperbolic component, then the orbit portrait is always strictly larger on the side which contains HP. This we already kind of saw, but let's try it. We will see again. In particular, the orbit portrait is always larger inside a primary way than it is outside. So good. And the non-monotonicity conjecture says, okay, so as we cross a secondary ray of a period Q, the period Q orbit portrait changes non-monotonically, so that neither of the two orbit portraits contain the other. All right, so monotonicity conjecture. In the main, in the primary way, and non monotonicity conjecture has to do with secondary rays. Okay, so let's see. Do I have an example? Yeah, I have this. So this is the period three tessellation of S1. This is the top of S1. And over here, um, I have a lot of primary rays. Uh, yeah, but what I wanted to to say is, okay, so you look at array uh, 22 over 24 and 17 over 24. Period three tessellation, sorry, 26, because it's the period three, so the denominator is 26. So this is 22 over 26 and 17 over 26. So, um, well, this is a wake, but this wake, um, is bounded by the rays 22, 17, and inside 19 and 20. But if you look at the orbit portrait of the ray, of the wake that uh, bounded by 17 and 22, look at it. It consists of these three. Um, well, this is the orbit portrait on the left, right? There are three pairs of rays landing together. Now, if you look inside, to the inside way uh, bounded by the rays 19 over 26 and 20 over 26, you see that the orbit portrait is bigger. I tried to draw it, uh, the new orbit is red now, and here the all orbit was black. So you can see that when you go, according to the monotonicity conjecture, when you go from this and you go to a parabolic point, then the orbit portrait changes. Now I can also go backwards, right? If I go from this and I go through the parabolic point down, what happens? The orbit portrait here is empty. So it changes. Um, yeah, so these are primary wakes and I don't, they don't, they are not useful for me to illustrate this uh, monotonicity conjecture, but that top one is because you can see how the orbit portrait of inside, it's much bigger or larger than the one in the bottom. But the one in the bottom is contained also on the top. Yeah, okay. So this is one example. This is another example. So in this case, we had four rays landing together. This is an example with period four in S3. Again, I think this is in the boundary of the airplane in, in the CO10 region. And you can see here, these are the, this is, so here I have primary rays, which are these rays that contain, contain the hyperbolic component, this little face of the Mandelbrot set. And we have secondary rays, which are here on the, on the tail kind of thing of the Mandelbrot set here. 
in this little copy, they contain in this case in the cusp is there. Okay, so over here, well, okay, I have a some orbit portrait, and you can just know because I just told you that everywhere inside this way, the orbit portrait is the same. Uh, but over here, uh, in the in the secondary weight, well, you have some orbit portrait, but uh, there is no no relationship between. For example, the orbit portrait the outside and the orbit portrait inside here, or this one and this one. I don't know if I already told you that. If you look at the two orbit portraits outside, you can see that, um, I don't think, uh, you can see that these two, uh, or, or the one inside, uh, the primary way is the amalgamation of the orbit portraits outside. So these are like put together, right? You just get one, which is in red. Look at it here. You see that rays uh, 73, 17 landing together and 59, 51, 59 landing together. Here they are. And then you have on the other side, 44, 76 in blue, 44, 76 and 52, 68. So this orbit portrait is amalgamation of the two outside. Okay. Yeah, so we never seen more than four rays landing together at a parabolic point. We don't know if it is possible that there are more, maybe, but we've never seen them. And, um, and, moving, and moving around uh, the the parabolic point, we distinguish two kinds of equivalence relations. Okay, so I want to talk about these two background relations, which are equivalent relations which hold uniformly for all, for all phases incident to the parabolic point, and distinguish relations which hold for at least one such phase, but not for all of them. Oh yeah, before I go, I go forward, let me uh, go back in my pictures. Mm. I want to show you a background relation in the um, in in the picture of the airplane that I had before, either even here. So I want you to focus your attention in the in this orbit portrait that I am. Uh, trying to make noticeable. And then you see, I, I draw it in red. If you go inside anywhere in this space, so this is in this space, this is what we're gonna call a background orbit, uh, background orbit or relation, because it holds for all the wakes in here. You see, you see how you go, from this phase, you get into the wake bounded by the angles 53 and 55, but you still have the same background relation that you had before. Same thing on the left for 62, 64. Same thing for 61, 56. Same thing for 58, 59. So this background relation holds in the whole phase. Um, of course, there are new new orbit pro, uh, primary relations ap uh, appearing. For example, here the black orbit, where you see three rays landing together. But this comes from the rays 53 and 55. And similarly, you know, for 56 and 61, you see another orbit of period three, different one. Correct. So you can see how this background relation holds in a whole phase and new relations appear when you cross the wakes, the parabolic point. Okay, good. I don't know how much time I have. Okay, so we talk about the monotonicity and non-monotonicity conjecture. I'll show you these pictures. Now I want to move around a parabolic point I said. 
and I want to do some convention. So for now on, for periodic angles will appear with a bar in the bottom. And periodic angles are going to appear is three times the coperiodic angle, and it's not going to have a bar. And sometimes we forget to draw the bars. But okay, so this is a cartoon of four rays landing together. Uh -huh. This is a cartoon of four rays landing together. So this is that all of these rays are coperiodic. So the coperiodic ray alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So you have the parabolic point P here, and you have uh, you know, the component that we call HP. So we say the orbit portrait is bigger or larger if, we, if you go in this weight. And so this is the primary weight in the F0, and F2 will be the secondary uh, weight. And we have another two phases here, phase one and phase three. Okay, so, and we want to say, in that, um, okay, we want to say that we, we see that the ray, that there is an integer H, so that essentially the corresponding dynamical ray for this alpha underline is equals to three times H for some uh, gamma, which corresponds to the coperiodic angle uh, gamma underline. So the, they are in the same orbit, okay? Alpha, the dynamical ray alpha and the dynamical ray gamma are in the same orbit. And similarly, the dynamical ray delta, this is not dynamical, but the associated dynamical ray delta and the associated dynamical ray beta are going to be also in the same orbit. Yeah, and also we notice that for this kind of, of, um, of relation of four rays landing together, these coperiodic angles alpha and beta are consecutive. So once you have alpha, you, know, you have your beta equals to just, you know, one over alpha plus one over three, big Q minus one. This is for when you have four rays landing together. So um, let's assume that we have our conjectures, the monotonicity conjecture, the Mandelbrot set, the yeah, the Mandelbrot conjecture about the parabolic points contain the the root point complete copies of the Mandelbrot sets, and the monotonicity conjecture, and the previous hypothesis that I told you. Then uh, we have the following relations uh, for the orbit portraits in the different phases. So for the primary phase, we have that all rays land together, okay? So this is what we are saying. All, all dynamical rays are landing together. For the side phase F1, then we have that, uh, the, the rays alpha three, well, in the orbit of alpha and in the orbit of beta, they land together. 3K alpha and 3K uh, gamma are related. For the secondary phase uh, F2, we have the relationship between uh, 3K alpha and 3K delta, and then between beta and gamma. And for the other side phase, we have relations between beta and delta. This is in the dynamical thing. Okay, I will show, I will illustrate this. And it follows that the orbit portrait for the primary phase, this is what I was talking about, is the amalgamation of the orbit portraits for the two side phases. Okay, so let me show you this picture. So, yeah, I think I already kind of told you this that, you know, but if you look, um, first look at the difference between the alpha ray, this is the alpha parameter ray, and this is the beta one. You can see that they differ by one over 240. Okay, so this is first thing I was saying. You can see that the, all rays land together here. We have all, all rays are landing together. 
well, of all orbits are related. And then we can see also that, as I mentioned before, that the orbit portrait of the primary wave is the amalgamation of the side phases. And then you can see in the secondary wave, which is this one, that what happens is that you get the ray, so kind of they go on the same side, they kind of go these two, the corresponding rays for these two land together and the corresponding rays, dynamical rays for these two land together. So this is more or less what is happening. And for the side phases, we go this ray and this ray because they are in the same orbit. So they land together, the corresponding dynamical rays. And for this phase, you go this ray and this ray are in the same orbit. When you translate to the dynamical rays. Okay. Okay, so here I'm just saying the same thing and I'm just saying, uh, right, and because this is period four orbit portrait, then the, I'm dividing by 80. And for the coperiodic rays, I'm dividing by 240. All right, so now what happens when, when we have three rays landing together? You remember that we saw three rays landing together. Well, we still have the relations that we are expecting to have. We expect that, um, okay, so if we consider three parameter rays landing at the point P and assuming that we have belt, uh, alpha, well, beta and alpha be, be, uh, being the difference between them just one, one apart over this, then we have the following relation. So for F0, we know that all rays land together or that the orbit portrait of this guy is going to be the amalgamation of the orbit portrait of F1 and F2. And then for F1, you have what you expect, that the corresponding rays of, actually, this is, this is the other way. These are, these are switched uh, because I have beta here. So it should be 3K beta and 3K gamma on for F1. And for F2, we should have 3K, wait a second. No, I'm wrong, okay. So this is correct. For F1, we should have, as I said, they go kind of like this. So we should have a relationship between the alpha ray and the gamma ray. And for the phase F2, we should have a relationship between this beta and this gamma. So the same kind of idea holds here too. Uh -huh. Okay, and examples, uh, I have examples here of three rays landing together. So these are two rays and this is another ray. And what is what I want to say that in this case, I have three rays landing together. And what do I want it? I want to look at the faces. So you can see that this in this side, this is what I can consider one face. And I have this orbit portrait on the top, 5, 25, 15, 23, 17, 19. And on the other side, I have two, 25, six, Oh, well, I don't even see 20, well, some, I don't know. I don't, I cannot read the numbers now, but the amalgamation, these two, the amalgamation of all the angles that appear here landing together, are going to land together over here. This is what the, the relationship said, and it's better, more understandable in this picture because the diagrams are bigger. So you can see, here, even when I don't have the same kind of distribution as before, but I still have three rays landing together. In this Mandelbrot copy of M53, this is also in the airplane region. Uh, you can see that the, the orbit portrait of the primary wave is the amalgamation of the orbit portraits of the phases F1 and F2. So if you look over here, you see that I have uh, 232, in blue, and I had 50 in red on the top and 47 in black on the bottom, and the three of them land together over there, right? 
And now if you continue the other things, you wanna see that it's exactly the same. So, yeah. And I can tell you that if you take this ray and the uh, ray gamma, then you obtain the orbit portrait for this face. And if you take this ray and the ray gamma, then you obtain the orbit portrait for this face. Okay, so what happens in the two ray case? Well, in the two ray case, you just have two rays. Therefore, you just have the relations by this that are, you know, produced by the two rays alpha and beta. And there are no distinguished relations outside because these are only affecting the component that contains the HP, the, in this case, DP, it is a parabolic point. And um, we have the obvious restriction that we want three alpha different from three beta. And in some cases, we have that the angles alpha, these angles are coperiodic angles, so they should be underlined. So these angles um, are uh, in the same orbit when I change to, to dynamical, um, to dynamical rays, but so sometimes the angles belong to the same grand orbit, but in other cases, they, be, they belong to different grand orbits. Uh, before I finish, let me show you the example. I think here. Okay, so what I wanted to say is that in this case, <clears throat> the rays 53 and 55 belong to the same grand orbit, because if you, this, if you say, so the denominators here are 26, and you say, okay, 26 times two is 52. So this, this 53 angle is gonna give you rise to a, to a dynamical ray one, and 55 will give you rise to a dynamical ray three, which is this one. And so you multiply one times three times nine, you get back to one, so they are in the same orbit, in the same grand orbit. But if you go with, 56 and 61, they are not in the same orbit because if you look, 56 will give you four and 61 will give you um, 52 minus 61 is nine. So one orbit will be four, 12, and then um, 10. And the other orbit will be uh, nine, I said nine, one, three. So they belong to different orbits. They land together, but they belong to different orbits. Okay, so, well, this is all what I have for today. If you have any questions, these are the references. And please let me know. Bien, entonces muchas gracias nuevamente a la profesora Araceli por la charla del día de hoy. ¿Hay, hay alguien que tiene alguna pregunta? I have a question. Yes, please. So, uh, um, is it true that the edges, the closure of the edges in the Tessellation of period P in the curve of period P is connected. Equals to Q. P equals to Q. Mm -hmm. Sim so, simply connected. No, no, no. The edges, the graph. Take yeah. out the faces. Uh -huh. So it seems weaker than your conjecture, but the uh, But, uh, but that could be true, right? Okay, could you repeat? Let me, let me try to understand. Uh -huh. so, so take out the faces in the period P tessellation. Uh -huh. You're left with a graph. Yeah. Could be connected or disconnected. You gave an example where for Q2 and P3, it was disconnected. Correct. So it is reasonable to, 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 to guess that you get something connected, right? Or P equals Q. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. Yeah. But uh, is that enough to prove simply connected or? <laughs> well, it's connected, but okay. So what I think is that the, the deal, the, what, what makes this to be simply connected is the fact that the components, the, um, when you are around the rabbit region, the rays are for every SP. If you, if you go, for example, to S3, and you take the three tessellation, those rays are period three. So, and those rays are going to give you the edges that connect everything. So they they cover. They don't let the the rabbit to be isolated anymore, because they connect you to the ideal point of the of the center of the rabbit escape region, and then they go to another escape region. And right. I and I claim that if you have S four. Then when you go to the to the rabbit region, you're going to have period that those Mandelbrot sets, those points are going to be are going to be uh, the rays are going to be periodic of period four, and that is what we think makes everything to be simply connected. Because can I try to uh, talk yes, to you them? can try, yeah. <clears throat> So if you just have a, a uh, forget where the one skeleton of the graph comes from, if you just have an abstract graph and a Riemann surface, certainly it can be connected even though the complementary faces are not simply connected. So it's, it's Jen is quite right that the conjecture that uh, the faces are all simply connected is, is a stronger conjecture conjecture. It would imply that the graph is connected, but the converse isn't true. But uh, so we're, we're guessing that it's true, but it's uh, we have no evidence. Well, certainly, certainly in all of the cases where P is different from Q and P greater than one, the, the rabbit regions will surely uh, the boundaries of the rabbit regions will disconnect the graph so that uh, the graph cannot be connected. So there was a, another point which I, I, which is minor, but you mentioned Araceli that a uh, parabolic points, it could be the root of more than one component or something like that, or I missed something. Well, no, they have to be the root of one component. Okay, okay, so when we know that. that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's okay. a conjecture. Well, no, so. no, no. What is, what is, what the conjecture is that the whole copy of the Mandelbrot set belongs, that, that all the Mandelbrot sets have costs. So, so that part I, I don't understand. So, so you, the you take like a, a maximal Mandelbrot set or something like that. and. So you take a parabolic and you take like a maximal Mandelbrot set where the parabolic lies or something like that, or? It's a conjecture that there is a unique maximal one. Okay. Yes. And there is a, an accurate copy of the Mandelbrot set, so it can't have two orbits in the same period uh, with the same root point. Yes, but, but didn't you, you prove that with this Hysinski method, every parabolic point is the root of a disjoint component or something like that? We had, we had, we had that, uh, but then it got revised. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that the Hessian's here argument proves that. That's also, well, I'll, I'll, I'm curious what, what is the, the subtlety in the argument that is revised. <laughs> okay. We, yeah. Well, we can, a, a we question can ask. What, what yeah. actually the Hessian's argument implies, I, I don't see how it would imply. We thought it will imply it, but it got revised. Well, 
Jen may be right, and I, I we should study it. Okay. Any other question? I have just one question, Professor. Uh, why did you choose this family? Why did I choose this family? Oh, uh, well, we said because you see, Milner wanted to study cubic polynomials, right? The dynamics of cubic polynomials. And then he, he found the nicest way to parameterize it so that he could, um, that you have information about the critical, the critical point and the critical value is to, to use that parametrization and, and to divide the, the space of cubic polynomials in, in a slides, in, in pieces, so that you could learn something a little bit, you know, in that slide, and then try to put everything together and maybe try to understand what happens in, as a whole. But uh, is that right? Um, since I'm the one responsible for starting this, maybe I should answer the question. Uh, certainly the critically finite points are important in studying any family of polynomial maps. And this is a family of, of, uh, of uh, one parameter curves, which includes all, po uh, together includes all possible critically finite points. In fact, usually the critically finite points are perhaps the intersection of a period P curve and a period Q curve, but uh, if, if one really understood all of this, you'd go, go a long ways towards understanding the full parameter space. Okay, thank you, Professor. We don't hear you, Alfredo. You are muted. More questions? Okay. Yes. In, hello. Hola. <laughs> Hola. Hello. I suppose that I have some actually reticence to accept the skip points. But I know that you are actually in parameter space in a slice of parameter space. But for example, if you actually parameterize the curves, how does the singularities look like? For example, if you have a parametrization of your S2 Q, of your S2 curve, so how does the, the parametrization near the punctures look like? Um, well, <clears throat> for the, near the punctures, you're, you're in an escape region and you certainly have the standard uh, theorem that each escape region is diffeomorphic to the uh, complement of the closed unit disk in, in C. So the, uh, and if you're away from the uh, puncture points, then we have a canonical para parameterization, which uh, is locally well behaved. So, so we understand the neighborhood of any, any point. It's just hard to put them all together. But in, in, for period two, is not simple enough actually to you get numbers or actual functions or is it's already complicated? Oh, no, period two, it's a, a simple, <laughs> simple formulas. And period three, it's a simple, simple form. Well, you have to use suitable functions. But for higher, higher periods, it's, it's harder. Yeah, we have to use for higher period like Hamiltonian, some Hamiltonian equation. It's certainly true that if you just look at the uh, curves in as subsets of C2, 
then we have horrible singularities at infinity. But if we just think of them as abstract Riemann surfaces, then they're kind of they, they, uh, they're well-behaved Riemann surfaces with uh, compactification just by filling in one point in each escape region. Any other questions? Hello. 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 I, I have some kind of silly question. Uh, so in the perspective of the orbit portrait, so is there any some kind of analogous property like in the quadratic sense? I mean, some okay. kind of orbit forcing or tuning or something. Maybe some small Mandelbrot set copy conjecture might be, uh, if, if that holds, then it might be some nice property, which, which is analogous to the quadratic case, maybe. I, I, I just wonder if there is. Jack, you want to answer? Well, I think we're certainly trying, we're certainly keeping the quadratic case in mind and trying to find analogous properties whenever possible. I mean, the copy of a idea of a wake is a direct copy of what happens in the metal of set. It's just that there are more complicated things going on in the cubic case. Yeah. Yeah, there is some, uh, some uh, student of Birk that did try to introduce some kind of orbit forcing um, a little bit for cubic polynomials, but uh, didn't get very far. And it's hard to understand what she wrote. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Bueno, eh, bueno, agradecemos nuevamente a la profesora Reseli por la presentación del día de hoy y así agradecemos también a todos los presentes por, por estar ahora. Y eso concluye el segundo día de la semana de dinámica compleja. Muy bien. Eh, Merecen descansar. Gracias. See you tomorrow. I want, I want to add something. This, this seminar week has been organized completely by graduate students. They actually, they get the logistic, they get in, in contact with all uh, the expositions. So I think that they also deserve actually our congratulations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. We noticed that, yeah. Thank you guys. Gracias por asistir. Hasta luego. Bye. Bye. Chao to everyone. Hasta luego. Bye. Bye. Chao. Now, how do we get out? <laughs>